the classic wrestling territories, there was one that numbered among the smallest geographically, but exerted an oversized influence on the world of pro wrestling and the people in it, Championship Wrestling from Florida. That outsized influence was due to one man, Eddie Graham. Called a genius, even a visionary by wrestlers and promoters around the world, he named champions, settled disputes, often decided the winners of promotional wars, and produced more successful booking protégés than any other promoter. Graham did all that from his home base in Tampa, Florida, the wrestling capital of a state where the sport had a clean public image and its stars were household names. For 25 years, pro wrestling was a nightly event before big crowds, before it ended in tragedy, in questions with no real answers. This is the story of Eddie Graham's empire in the Sunshine State, Championship Wrestling from Florida. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Back to the Territories here from Kayfabe Commentaries. I'm Jim Cornette, and once again, the DeLorean alternator trouble, but fortunately, Professor Whoopi had the Wayback Machine that he was able to let us have, and we can now go back to the golden years of championship wrestling from Florida. And our guest to discuss one of the great promotions, one of the great territories, is uniquely qualified because he worked there not only as talent in two different decades, also as a booker, possibly even a surrogate son to mm -hmm. Eddie Graham. What has God wrought? Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, the devil himself, Kevin Sullivan. Thank Kevin, you, thank you for being here. Great to be here. Great to be here. When, I mean, anybody in, 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 in the business, Florida was known as going to work for Eddie Graham. Right. And anytime somebody talks about championship wrestling from Florida, it is Eddie Graham's story, uh, maybe even more so than the other territories because his impact was not only felt in his own territory, but it reached around the country and around the world and his protégés and the people that he mentored and the disputes he settled and the champions that he decided. Talk about Eddie Graham, the person. You knew him well. Okay. Uh, here's something that to me was amazing. Eddie Graham probably dropped out of school in the fifth grade. Eddie became a pilot. A captain of the industry, right? Yeah. He was a captain of a boat, you know. He could take a 20-ton boat around the world if he wanted to. Eddie was a fanatic, you know, you got OCD and you understand this. Details, details, details. I mean, sometimes I wonder, now I look back on it, you know, was sometimes put pressure on some of the guys because I've told you this story, Jimmy, that uh, when I first started, he gave me a finish. When I first got in the territory, I think they tested everybody this way, but he gave me a finish, and it was like, and it was with Bobby Shane, so I was working with an incredible worker. The boy wonder. Yeah. yeah, and the thing was, Bobby was a big fan of mine, and he really wanted me to do well in the business. So the finish was like, we have a double crash, but I go outside the ring, right? And Bobby gets up, he hits the ropes, goes give me the tackle. I come over the top, sunset flip him. He kicks out. I end up going on the apron. He goes to run my head into the post. I put my foot up on the post, take his head, hit it off the turnbuckle. Bobby staggers, gives me a chance to climb. I dive to give him the flying body press. Bobby gets it, rolls me through. One, two, kick out, backslide. And I mean, this went on for about six minutes, but during the finish was I was going to hit Bobby with three drop kicks, and Bobby was putting me over because he was a huge star, and, uh, you know, they yeah. didn't expect it. So before the finish was I was supposed to hit him with three drop kicks, and now the length of this finish, I was not talking to anybody after I went in. Eddie had his own little room. You'd go in, and he'd sit you down, and... Well, uh, this is, uh, we're going to take the gold, put it in the pan, and we're going to sift it out. Anything <laughs> we don't need, we're going to get rid of it, because we're going to have, at the end of this night, we're going to have nothing but gold nuggets. This is going to be a gold nugget match. So right away you're saying, boy, he's got, you know. Yeah, he, he's he had, building you up, yeah, right? Yeah, you're yeah, about yeah, to walk through yeah, hell with gasoline yeah, bridges on. Yeah. yeah. And then he starts his finish, and he, Okay, 
And you got to remember, I had just come in from Nick, right? Yeah. What are you going to do for finish? Sunset flip. Yeah, sunset yeah. flip, yeah. swamp hacking. I'm going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm walking around, and I'm like, oh, but don't please talk to me, you know? So, like I said, the, the finish probably was three and a half minutes long. And I thought I was great. And now he had given finishes for eight matches that night. Some of the couple of tags, you know, so it was yeah. not an easy night for him either. So I come back up. What do you think, Ed? And he says to me, where was the third drop kick? He just turned <laughs> around and left out. I went, whoa. <laughs> I'm never going to get anything by him if he's just, you know, and he's watching matches before me and after me, you know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't run up to see him right away. It was like a couple of matches later and he could remember it. So his attention to detail, I think, you know, we've talked about this, Jimmy. I think the guys from his era, Eddie, Mark Lewin, the guys that became good bookers, they were all around Buddy Rogers. Yeah. And they all wanted to emulate Buddy. And like we've talked about, Buddy put in different move sequencing, if you will. He put in different moves. So I think these guys took that. Also, Eddie learned a lot from... Uh, Funk Sr. in Doc Sapolis out there. And he's actually out in Amarillo as Rip Rogers, you know, Buddy's cousin. Though. Which is where our good friend yeah. Hustler Rip Rogers got his name yeah. in the modern day. But yeah, he was supposed to be Buddy Rogers' cousin yeah. Rip yeah. In, in Amarillo. Yeah, so I think uh, that you can look back and say, you know, the seed for this was planted by Buddy. And the guys that wanted to keep up understood that Buddy was, you've told me, he'd go into territory with the guys that he wanted to work with, A, yeah. that weren't going to hurt him, and they were going to make him look good. That were beholden to him and would stand up with him instead of the promoter in case right. they made a power play for the better payoffs, right. which is why he was installing his crew to begin with, which right. is the way he almost took over Vince Sr.'s territory right. until Bruno's fan club president, Stooged off because she heard it while she was visiting Buddy's wife, but that's another story. Yeah. Um, Eddie Graham, like you said, fifth grade education or whatever, but he was a, a licensed pilot and he was a, 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 a captain of the industry. He had a TV empire and all these live events and everything, but he was in in the business. He was viewed as a as a visionary, right. as a creative genius. His finishes were were the best. They were. T t tried and true over years of working in front of big crowds and knowing what gets people's emotions, right? And, and being able to see the talent and see who he wanted them to be and how he wanted them to be portrayed for the people to, to grab onto him. But he also, he was a guy that settled disputes. Right. Uh, who was, was there anybody more powerful in the NWA? Him, Barnett, and... No, he, Eddie was the most powerful guy. There might have been guys close to him. And Sam Muchnick as yeah. the president yeah. and over a period of time, but... But if there was a debate, Eddie settled the debate, they went his way. I, I'll i tell you a real quick story. I w went to St. Louis, and the night I was there was Flair's first time in St. Louis. So that was, to me, they were thinking about him as the world yeah. champion. Whenever you went to St. Louis and got put over, that yeah. was a stepping stone to the NWA yeah. title. And usually, you know, whoever won the Missouri State title would become the champion. Yeah. I mean, you could go back to Briscoe, uh, Bobby Backlund, everybody. And I remember Rick coming to me and asking me about a move that he didn't know. And I didn't want him to falter because right. this you know this is St. Louis right yeah. so I went to Pat O'Connor because Pat brought me in for that night and I actually worked with Pat he I said I, I think you need a kind of uh tail of this finish for Rick a little bit different and uh, he asked me the problem I gave him told him what I thought and I said you don't want the kid to fall on his ass because they've sent him here right obviously yeah. I was smart enough to understand and he said, well, I'll be right back. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to go on the phone to Eddie and get a better finish. I went, <laughs> I, said, I went to myself, they're calling Eddie. He's not here. I don't know if he's seen Flair work yet. Probably has, you know, yeah. up in the Atlantic. But 
they weren't sure of their own finish. They want to make sure that Eddie. You call Eddie. Yeah, get get, yeah, get yeah, Tampa yeah, on the phone. Yeah, yeah. Well, you remember when um, when uh, Jerry Jarrett split off from Nick Goulas in 1977? Nick had been a member of the NWA since 1949, and the only support he got was from the Sheik because right. they were close from the, and and he got a bunch of talent down from Detroit. Talent, I say loosely, yeah. but. Nothing else from the NWA. And six weeks, the war was over. Jared had won. He took Memphis. His first card back in the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis. Who's on the card? Jack Briscoe, Dusty Rhodes, Mike, Mike Graham, Kevin, Kevin Sullivan, <laughs> and Eddie Graham came in the back, yeah. right? As yeah. to show that I validated Jerry Jarrett's promotion because everybody knows Nick's a tightwad. Yeah. And, and that was the way it was. And uh, that was the night Holly wrestled uh, Dusty. Yep. And there was, uh, you know, he jet and he had another presence the first time the old Omni ran Jimmy Mike and I were on that show he and the other thing was he was God bless Mike uh, he was one of my dearest friends and he was under a horrible strain with the father in different situations we'll get to that but Eddie knew that Mike wasn't going to be the world heavyweight champion but he also knew that Mike was a good talent and he wanted Mike to be in the wrestling business. So he actually would, you know, book Mike in these, get not just Mike, myself and different guys in his right. territory that we went out. We became almost a little bit more desirable. It reminds me if I always tell a story. When cores, you couldn't get it, you know, uh, west. Past the, Denver pa or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was that mystique. People would drive out and get it. It was he made Florida a mystique place. You know what I mean? They had more wrestling, which they hadn't seen. They had their champion for years. Briscoe was a wrestler, right? Yeah. So he he was very much into that. And the other thing, how clever he was, he had not the. Uh, U.S. Senator to give him a flag on t on a wrestling program, right? Yeah. The mayor of Tampa gave me an award and Michael an award different times. I mean, he had political clout. Well, let, let, let's talk about this for a second because the one thing that I used to note when I would watch the Florida tape was it seemed like every week somebody was giving Eddie Graham or the promotion a civic award. Right. The Boy Scouts, the Boys and Girls Club, the Boys Ranch, the right. the ball team of some kind, the amateur wrestling uh, team, local sports kit, just anybody that was d deserving, uh, Eddie Graham would have done something or he had the company do something to help out. And as a result, for weeks and weeks and years and years, they saw him getting these civic honors and awards right. uh, that, that showed not only was wrestling a good, wholesome sport, but that Eddie Graham was uh, you know, the next best thing to you know, the president. And it had an effect in that I think, just judging from what I was able to see, the brief period that I, I would go down there, wrestling had a, it was like, it was like in the Carolinas. People liked wrestling in the Carolinas and it had right. a bit better of an image. Right. It had a better image in Florida than it did in most places because of that kind of work and the people seeing, well, you know, even if we may not like wrestling, they sure are doing good for the community. Right. And that was, of course, it was brilliant. It was great PR, it helped everybody. And the other thing, Jimmy, as you know, uh, very little, we'll say in uh, Nashville because of Nick, not yeah. many people would write articles on wrestling, right? Right. Eddie had a lot of newspaper men in his pocket. They were on the payroll. Yeah. So they may do an article about Eddie Graham. If you didn't, if you watched, you know, Channel 44 last week, you saw that Eddie Graham received the uh, award of freedom from the state senator, uh, yeah. you know, U.S. congressman. And after that, bye, 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 he go into the percentage that the boys club, the sheriff's boys ranch, and oh, by the way, last week uh, in Fort Lauderdale, a uh, police officer died on duty. Eddie donated the money for the proceeds in Fort Lauderdale to his family. Yeah. So and then as the article kept on going, and then they would say, and Dusty Rhodes is wrestling high race in uh, St. Pete 
this Sunday. It looks to be a great exhibition. Uh, Dusty is coming into his own, and they would just drop that little word, exhibition, rather than, you know, yeah. so they could get out of it gracefully yeah. and still plug the town. And he had that going for him in, in Tampa. He had it in Miami. He had it in all, all the major clubs. So, yeah. And the other thing is, it's kind of hard after you see all this good stuff. Then Dusty comes on and hangs me, and I got juice shooting up four <laughs> rows up. The people say, well, they do good for the community. You yeah. know what I mean? They might have done good for the community, but not my head. You know what I mean? But, yeah, you're absolutely right. When, when you first came in, uh, it was to to be Mike's partner. It, Mike had turned pro probably about a year mm. before, and uh, Eddie had had he had been a top star in Florida in the early '60s. That's how right. he got in that position, which we'll go into when we talk about the the history of the territory. But um, he'd never focused on himself as a single after that initial setup period. He didn't put the singles belt on him. He and Sam Steamboat right. or a few partners would have tag team titles on occasion. But he had actually announced and, and publicly had bought into the promotion with Cowboy Luttrell, who'd mm -hmm. been the Florida promoter since the 40s. But when Mike started wrestling, he even went so far, Eddie did, as to have the newspapers print that he had given his promoting interest, his matchmaking interest, over to Buddy Fuller. Right. And that he was going to go on the road with his son Mike as a father-son tag team. He didn't want the people to think that, okay, now my son's here and I'm the promoter and I'm going to be wrestling and he's going to go over. It was that attention to detail that that set him apart but how did, when you became Mike's partner right after that right uh, how did you get that spot and 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 how did you first start your relationship with Eddie uh, this is a funny thing I actually went to Florida with Robert to be Robert's partner Robert Fuller yeah and uh, I was Robert and I were gonna go to Australia together be partners because we had been partners in you know Tennessee yeah and and that was at a period of time, not to digress, but Barnett had brought Les Wel Lester yeah, Welch, yeah, one of the Welches, yeah. into Australia as a partner, and right. then Jimmy Golden made a trip, so there was a Tennessee-Australia connection there for just a second. Right, so we were going to go, and I mean, they offered a ridiculous amount of money in those days, I thought, and uh, Robert said, no, and this is how well-planned, Eddie, what you just said laid it out. Robert comes up to me and says, no, my dad just took over Florida. We're going to go to Florida instead. So Robert's buying that his dad has his <laughs> territory, right? Now Ronald owned uh, West Palm Beach, right? Yeah. So when we get down there, uh, we'll book maybe for the first week around together. The second week, I'm in singles, Robert's in singles. And... Uh, Eddie saw, and I think some, I um, think Bobby Shane went to Eddie and said, they look alike, they're the same size. I think it would be good to have a young tag team. I'd like to get them over. Bobby was a really, you know, uh, we've talked about Bobby before. Yeah. But it's, he, it's too bad that people don't know who he was. He could make a guy in a night, right? And especially two young punks. But when I got with them, this is how much attention the detail Eddie was. Eddie said to me, uh, have you ever wrestled before? I said, amateur? I said, yeah, I have. He said, okay, I want you to come to the Heroes Gym tomorrow and we'll uh, work out. You and Mike will just work out. I thought he meant weights. Well, I get there and all there are is mats on the floor, right? So Eddie <laughs> says, okay, why don't you guys go at it? And uh, Mike was very good and exceptionally strong, right? But I think I could. He was, I, he was a, a pretty world class level power lifter in his yeah, younger he, days. Yeah, he right? had the record in Florida, I believe, for the longest time. He benched uh, 425 at 198. And uh, Mike was an, had ex exceptionally strong tendons. And uh, Mike was a tough guy. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, he wasn't going to let his old man down. You know what I mean? He, yeah. really, he was going to stand up for the business, Mike stood up for business. You know, back then it was a different game. So they get me wrestling Mike, and I'm not going to say that I could have beat him, but I'm smart enough to realize I better not. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I better hold my own. Yeah. And I did hold my own. And uh, You can't be a pushover, but no, you got to you got to do yeah. the job in the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I often thought, why did he do that? And I thought, 
well, if we put me and Mike together and I got the shit kicked out of me, they wouldn't say Kevin Sullivan got the shit kicked out of him in a bar. They were going to say Mike Graham did. Yeah, because you know I mean? he was the one that was famous and yeah. you guys looked so much alike yeah. at the time. Yeah. yeah. So Eddie wanted to make sure I could cover my ass, I think. And because back in those days, you know, if you got in a fight and you, Stan Lane will tell you yeah. that. I mean, <laughs> he had to leave the territory, right? <laughs> if Because he beat up a guy so bad. Yeah. If you lost the fight, you were uh, gone. You know what I mean? If you lost the fight, you got fired, and if you won the fight, <laughs> you, you had sued. to leave town because <laughs> yeah. you got sued. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so then, uh, gradually over a period of time, you got you got closer with Eddie. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I had, uh, you know, because I was around Mike so much, and it got to be a point where Eddie kind of, t you know, he, I think, I, I say this reflecting back, I'm sure he liked me, you know, and he liked that I would do what Mike wanted to do, like go to the gym. I was trying to keep, you know, trying to keep on the straight and narrow, but we were two wild young kids. But uh, he says to me one day, uh, you want to go fishing? And I said, wow, this is strange. I said, what time is Mike going to pick me up? He said, no, I, you come down to the dock. Thinking, wow. So I'm on the dock, and we'll get into this in a little while. And I go out fishing with Eddie. Now he starts telling me the problems he's having with Mike because he has, Eddie himself has had marital problems or pseudo marital problems, yeah. right? And uh, he unloads on me and tells me something that only Barnett and Terry Funk knew. So I'm now given this secret code. That and you carry the burden. <laughs> yeah, and I carry the burden, and I also have Mike up my ass because I'm not understanding what the problem is between his mother and father, but I do understand what the problem is. There's no problem, you know what I mean? Yeah. He just doesn't understand it. So as this continued on, and we'll get into whenever you want. Uh, well, go ahead. Go okay. ahead. We're this far now. We can just, just jump what right in. What happened here. was when Eddie was in, a, in Amarillo, he got divorced after Mike was born, like maybe when Mike was two or three. But because he loved his boy so much that he stuck with his wife. And they moved to Florida, like you said, the whole thing, they moved into a trailer park, and then from the next thing he buys the company that he's living in this magnificent home, swimming pools, he bought Mike one right down the street, swimming pools. And, uh, they were like very civil to one another. They went everywhere in Florida together, you know, Miss and Mrs. Graham. Yeah. But nobody knew they weren't married. There was only three people that knew they weren't married. So now, and Mike, before he died, found out about it and confronted me. And it was the hardest thing in the world for me to tell him. He said, why did you tell me? I said, how could I have told you, you know? Yeah. And then he said, now I look back on it, I, things fall into place. He said, I guess I was too hard on my dad. I said, yeah, and it wasn't my place to tell you, you know. So he stays with Lucy, but they had, they weren't married, and I think they were allowed to do whatever they wanted to do. He had a girlfriend. Mike got mad about that. And Mike's mother was uh, a Southern Belle, genteel, and she could have been a model at 55 to 60 years old, striking red hair. She owned the boutique in Florida. Every, I mean, then she had a, a special place before I ever saw these fake nails, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, she, uh, yeah. she opened that up, and I mean, everybody was going to Lucy's. You'd walk in, and they were poured a bo uh, from a bottle of Dom Perignon, not the cheap stuff, you know. <laughs> you, this, the ladies are sitting there thinking they're queen for the day. If she was really a wrestling wife, she'd have put the you know cold <laughs> yeah, duck in the Dom yeah. Perignon bottle. In yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Oh, you like that one? Huh? There you go. But the thing was, so I kind of became the surrogate son because Eddie's bitching. And then I, I told you just a little while ago, one time 
we're, we're fishing, it was a Thursday, and we have to go to Jacksonville. So you'd have to leave early because that was one of the longest trips in the territory. It's about 220 miles, and you had, it was not all interstate. Yeah, oh, I, I remember that. You remember you that? Go with the Yee yeah, Junction yeah, yeah, and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I go to Eddie. I, I need to get back to the dock. He said, nah, the fish are hitting. Come on, let's stay. I said, I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to meet Mike. He said, uh, Michael, no, you're not there. I told him you're going fishing. I'll fly you. I'm thinking, boy, I'm flying up to Jacksonville and Mike is driving. This is going to be nice when I get there, right? Yeah. And Mike was really uh, cool about it. He said, hey, uh, I understand. I'm just not getting along with my dad. He said, good for you. You didn't have to drive. You know what I mean? So uh, that's how I became close to him. And then because I became close to him that way, he would kind of, uh, I tell you one time that I really shocked him, and I probably cost this guy his job, okay? Louis Tillet, you know the dusty finish? Yes. That's yeah. Louis Tillet's finish, okay? <laughs> so at the end of the year, they had, you know, the year in review, and most of it was Briscoe against somebody, you know? Yeah. And there was if not the greatest babyface, one of the top ten, right, Jack Briscoe? I'm watching the thing, and every finish is a dusty finish. So Eddie comes out beaming because, you know, it's like anything else. If you watch it enough. Yeah. And he w didn't watch it, I found out, see? So he was going to go through me and see what my reaction was. Then he was going to look at it. And I, he said, what did you think? And I said, it sucked. It was the first time I ever said anything like that to him. He said, what do you mean? I said, every finish was exactly alike. Well, he went down, he, he went to the, got Dave Togi, made him go take the tape back then and put it in and watched it. Louis was relegated to the second towns and that's how Dusty got his start in Dusty and Watts. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, yeah, so that was, when that happened, then he would let me sit in, and Dusty too, when Dusty came in, but when he found some of the, he kind of thought that was on the same wavelength with him, like the Funks or the Briscoes, yeah. you know, you kind of, he'd say, hey, sit in here and tell me what you think about this. Well, I'll tell you a funny story about Eddie. I'm, ha I'm happy to be driving to Orlando with him. And Eddie said, well, I got this finish. He said, and this is what they're gonna do in the main event. And he said, but I'm not going to say anything. He said, just come in with me. And this was a big thing going into the Peel dressing room, you know. Yeah. You know, even though Orlando would be like coming in here, no one's going to see us, but we didn't do that. So I sat down. I watched Eddie work. He said, boys, what are you going to do tonight? And they're all scratching their heads and, you know, <laughs> figuring things out. Jimmy, in 15 minutes, they came up with the exact same finish Eddie had told me in the car. <laughs> he just steered them that way and they had no idea which way they were going either. The only few guys that, I'll, this is how smart he was. Terry Funk is gonna work with Jack Briscoe in Miami. Now, when the Funks came in, 98% of the time, dust, uh, Eddie would go to wherever the Funks were wrestling. Right. So they were only coming in, Terry was only coming in from Miami because Jack was going to wrestle Dory at the end of the month. We'll say it was the first of the month and the end of the month he was gonna wrestle Dory for the title. So, Louis Tillet goes over and uh, Terry says, what do you want him to do? And uh, he said, you don't mind putting him over in the middle, do you? So Terry said, no, of course not. <laughs> so, the next day we got TV, and Eddie comes in and he says, hey, what did you do, what kind of uh, out did you give Funk last night? And Louis said, oh, he said he'd lose in the middle of the ring. And Eddie said, I guess we won't see Terry for a while. So, Louis calls Terry up, you know, make sure everything is okay. He said, uh, when Dory comes in, we'd like you to work with Morocco. He said, I can't. My horse is horse sick. Horse is sick. <laughs> you know, he did the horse is sick. And Eddie said, Louis, that isn't a way to get these guys to do what you want. He said, and with beating Terry, 
He's They'll do what you want yeah. once yeah. to get out of there, yeah. and then they won't come back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, let, let's let's get Eddie Graham in Florida first okay. of all, because some of these young whippersnappers may not realize uh, the career he had before then, why he was in a position to buy the territory, why he was in a position to be in the main events. Started out Eddie Gossett, his right. real name, in the Tennessee territory because he's from around Chattanooga, and wrestled Tennessee early years. He was in in Texas as Rip Rogers, like you said, but he also had a run in Florida in like 1954 as Eddie Gossett. Really? And I, I don't even think he had blonde hair at that point in time. Uh, apparently nobody remembered him. But what they did remember him for was the run in the Northeast, in Madison right. Square Garden, uh, when he became a Graham brother. Dr. Jerry Graham, one of the most famous, most eccentric heels uh, in the history of the business. Vince McMahon Jr.'s favorite wrestler. Right. Red suits, Cadillac, no top, down to you know, Broadway right. in, in lighting cigars with $100 bills and whole nine yards. Um, he became Jerry Graham's brother, and they weren't the first of the Bleach Blonde tag teams, but they were one of the best known. They right. sold out the garden. They were big all the, over the Northeast. The Capitol Wrestling tape at that point was syndicated to a variety of stations, so the Graham brothers and their manager, Bobby Davis, who Bobby Heenan right. was named after, right. were big-time heels. And when he left, Eddie Graham left the Northeast, he went to Florida. He won the Florida title in 1962. Uh, that's when Cowboy Luttrell still owned the company. I think he bought in shortly thereafter, probably with the money that he'd made in New York. Right. But that started a lifelong connection between Eddie and Vince Sr. because mm -hmm. there was always cooperation between the WWWF and the Florida Territory, even if it didn't go through the NWA or whatever, even to the point where Vince had a winter home in Florida right. or a summer home or whatever, whichever season he spent in Florida. Right. And the tapes, the Florida tape was shown in New York on the right. Spanish station. Everybody thought, well, that's an accident. Yeah. No. no. Um, was Eddie probably the only guy that could pick up the phone and talk to Vern Gagne, Sam Mushnick, and, and Vince McMahon Sr. anytime he wanted to? I think he was the only guy that could pick up the phone and be on their level. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because they all respect him about his brain. And uh, I'll give you a quick story, real quick. Take your time. <laughs> Jack Briscoe was our world champion, right? NWA. And Vince got a little scared of the ethnic champions, Bruno and Pedro, after. Uh, Mulligan had been stabbed. They were having so many riots. Either the Puerto right. Ricans upset if, if right. Pedro ever lost, or et cetera, et cetera, and they were having troubles. And Mulligan almost got flayed, you know, yeah. when he got stabbed so many times. And then the guy had put urine on the knife, so he got an infection inside. I was up in the office when this happened. Vince, it was in the winter time. Vince was down in Florida. He lived by Lauderdale by the sea. He lived in a beautiful cul-de-sac right here was his home. Graham was his home, it's right over here. So I've been both. So he decided that he wanted to do what Eddie did with Jack Briscoe. An all-American boy. An all-American boy. And Vince had watched the Florida wrestling and he said, hey, I like that guy Backlund. You got, he's an all-American boy, amateur wrestler, all this. And Eddie said to him, yeah, he's great, but you want to take Kern because of his father's background. If you're looking for the All-American boy, and the kid can talk better than Bobby, and uh, I think you can make a lot more money quicker with Steve, you know, yeah. in the angle with the father. Who was a war hero yeah, in a yeah. uh, uh, Seven, prisoner of war in twice, Vietnam. Twice, yeah. Vietnam and World War II. That's right, that's right. So he said, uh, no, nah, I'm going to go with Backlund. And they got in this little kind of joust thing where they were laughing. And Eddie said, I bet you $100 that you can't make Backlund like you can uh, uh, Kern. And he said, oh, I'll make him OK. <laughs> and that's what he did, right? He built it. It was over. Who did he get the 100 bucks? Yes. <laughs> yes, he did. I mean, so yeah, uh, like you said, could Eddie pick up the phone? Yeah. And you know, when Eddie called you, I mean, I, I had heard Vince call Eddie before a big taping or when he was going to switch the title. What do you think I should do for the next show? Uh, who, who do you see that's ready? 
and Eddie would give him a finish, you know what I mean? But you know, the funny thing was, when he sent that finish up there, it wasn't a Florida finish. It was a version of a Florida finish. That would fit their yes, style yes, and their yes, pattern. They yeah. tailored it to. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that's something, now that I'm sitting here looking at it on paper, when Graham made his move after the, the run in the Northeast and went to Florida, that was the last move he made. Yeah. It was, and, and you very seldom find that. Vern did it right. in Minneapolis. Lawler did it. Basically, right. came back from, you know, Florida and Georgia in '75, and it never really left again. Right. Uh, but he stayed. He he bought into the territory. And at the time, Florida traditionally was a good, solid business state, but it had it had never done anything spectacular. There weren't the outdoor shows or the stadium shows or whatever. Mm -hmm. but it was good, solid business. And talk about the towns and, and 25 years of, ter of uh, history of the territory. I know the nights changed right. and the schedule changed and whatever, but typically in the glory years, what was your week? What were the okay. towns? I'm going to tell you uh, again how Eddie was a forward thinker. When Eddie went down there and bought in, that territory only ran in the winter. Really? It wasn't even well, year round. Wasn't year round. And Eddie said, the cowboy, he said, We're just you're just catering to tourists. We need to cater to the good old boys that live down here. Yeah. You know, you got to realize at that time, uh, Florida was really rural. It was the second largest cattle producing state. Yeah. Of course, it was the first in citrus, right? A lot of uh, vegetables growing up there. A lot of migrant workers. If you look back at the beginning of Eddie's run, you see Cyclo Negro, you see Jose Lothario, Hispanics, Hispanics. Yeah. Eddie used blacks early, yeah. you know? So, I mean, he had a grasp of things that most of us wouldn't have got the grasp, especially back then, those old time promoters, you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they weren't civic minded or didn't even know, you know, what was going on really. They, we do it this way because this is the way we always did it. Right, right. So, when he opened it up, what they would do is Sunday was Orlando, Monday was West Palm, Tuesday was Tampa and Fort Pierce. If he wanted to cool you down, I mean, uh, Fort Myers. If he wanted to cool you down for a while, he'd send you to Fort Myers. When, he, when I had had my run with Mike and they broke us apart for a while, he sent me to uh, Fort Myers with Dickie Slater and said, you two book the town. I don't care what you do, just give me a list of the talent and I'll tell you if you can have them. But yeah. you've got to have this booked, you know, every, you got to have it three weeks out so I know yeah. what you're going to do. And then if I have to take somebody, I will. So Dickie and I got a chance really to get our feet wet, right? So, but Wednesday was Miami. Thursday was Jacksonville. Friday was either Fort Lauderdale or Tallahassee. And Saturday was once a month Lakeland which was right outside of Tampa, yeah. uh, St. Pete right outside of Tampa, Sarasota right outside of Tampa, and Daytona right outside of Orlando. So he would... And also West Palm, Fort Lauderdale, yeah. and Miami are like 60 miles apart for the three of them over on the other side. Right, so. right. And he... he uh, Different I, cards everywhere. Yeah, not like, you know, we'll say with Nick, where he ran the same yeah. card in every town, you know what I mean? And Eddie would also kind of back off of West Palm a little because he wanted to, he would take West Palm on a Monday to be the showcase for leave him hanging till Wednesday, that match is yeah. coming, you know what I mean? It'd be like the Midnight Express, a wrestling fantastic, so God love him too. Uh, but the rock and roll hit the ring and saved them, you know? But isn't it a coincidence the rock and roll of and midnight rest of wrestling yeah, on Wednesday yeah. just right down the road? Yeah, Come on, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing is you talk about it being weekly, and for a lot of those years, Miami Beach did three, four, five thousand people a week, every week. And that's not in the hot periods; that's no. just regularly right. every Wednesday night at the convention hall. Dusty used to talk about for all of you folks old enough. Jackie Gleason used to tape his television show right. there from Miami Beach, the greatest audience in the world. Dusty loved to sneak in to the dressing room that Jackie Gleason would use and, and shit on Jackie Gleason's <laughs> toilet. See, just, you know, to say he, their asses had been in the same place. Um, that's another thing when you talk about cooling somebody down. 
the, the really artistic bookers used to be able to do that because after a guy's been in a hot program. Right. And all of a sudden, you know, you, you, you can't just, you know, be the main event every week from now till the end of time. But you don't want to diminish the guy's status. So how can I miss you if you won't go away? The fans in Tampa wouldn't see him because he'd be over in the other right. town and do a little program there because that was the secondary town. They didn't get to see the top talent all the time. So right. they're glad to have this main event guy that's worn out his welcome over here. Right. And he was able in the same state while using everybody on television to still put the pieces together where you created a demand for a guy that's still in your territory and never went anywhere. Right. That's amazing. And also that you had the Bahamas every so often, right? Well, oh, I, I forgot about that. The, the Bahamas ran a once vacation. a month. Once yeah. a month. And that was Nassau. And then every other month, Nassau and Freeport would run. But when Eddie first took over Florida, Cuba ran. And when I first went to Florida, Eddie had Puerto Rico. So we go to That's Puerto Rico. And can you imagine wrestling in Cuba? They probably right. and now that that may be the last untapped wrestling market, right. Cuba, because they right. haven't seen wrestling in 50 years, yeah. right? Yeah, they'll still believe it. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, what were the houses like and the crowds like in the other towns? It, it, on on average, I mean, I know there's peaks and valleys, but to get a grip of in in one state, how many people were buying tickets to see live wrestling matches uh, just per week? It's it's uh, insane. Jimmy, in all the houses that we're talking about, if it wasn't half full or three quarters full, something was wrong. Something was going to be altered quickly. And, and you're talking about buildings that seat three, four, five, six thousand people. Yeah, some of them seat more. Yeah. You know? And the beauty of this was on Sunday you went to Orlando, you knew if Saturday TV got over because Orlando was the barometer. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was. Even though Orlando is Orlando now, back then it was a, you know, a urban center where uh, uh, the town met the uh, farm. You know what yeah. I mean? So you're drawn from two sections of people. So if it got over in Orlando, you, you knew, okay, we'll build on this TV. But if it didn't get over in Orlando, that pro program would be done and dusted. Done and do know? something else. Yeah, yeah. So I, he, he and, just had a... I don't, we're going to go all yeah. over the place. And folks, you bear with us. You're going to yeah. get knowledge here. It's just going to be... I see one guy's <laughs> nodding off already. But that's, Was it Orlando? Were you? Was it you and Black Jack that did the thing where you fought out the back door? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Tell, tell us. That's one of my favorite things of all time. I, uh, I was lucky enough, Jimmy, that, you know, I had monsters to work with, you know. So they, you know, I always say this. You know the movie The uh, Alien... Remember when the guy's sitting there? Yeah, and, goes, a... and this little thing this big gets out. What if they took a fly swat and went, Puh, you know? So at the end of the mo movie, do you remember how big the monster was? Yeah. Well, is that in our head or is that monster have grown that big, right? So that's what they did to me. They made me a monster from this big, right? So, and I was lucky to work with all these big baby faces. So Mulligan and I go get into the thing. Dusty comes up with the idea. He says, once you fight guys, fight outside and go out in the back. And, and this was in a huge, Orlando Sportatorium was like in a huge field, right? Yeah. So we go out fighting and we're fighting down the road, you know, and people are trying to get out, but they couldn't get out the back door, so they're going out the front. We're fighting in the, in the, in the field and Blackjack slamming me in the dirt and all this. It's pitch black dark pitch outside. Pitch black dark out. Mm -hmm. He's whacking me in the head and he's stiff as board, but he can't see. So... That's the end, you know, finally they kind of, we get away and we go for each other and the cops come and the next, next week as the matches start, me and Blackjack come through the front door like we've been fighting all week. We we're come, in the same shit, right? We're in the same <laughs> shit and dirty and come right through, roll right through the ring and stop. The guys in the ring stop working, we'll look at us and we go right out of the ring and die. Down the aisle. Now, see, that sounds like something that I wouldn't be into. <laughs> oh, but, but no, the level of creativity and just and just for the visual. And yeah. it didn't, it, you know, it just, all right. Um, there were great local promoters down right. there, too, because Eddie had a, had a small office, because all the territories did. Right. We talked to Baron Von Raschke, Bruiser's office was in his garage. Yeah. Uh, but they had great local promoters. Don Curtis was in Jacksonville, right. right? Don Curtis and Mark Lewin were a great tag team years gone by. John Heath in Sarasota, right? right. right? Yeah. Coach John Heath, who also 
did the TV show with Gordon Soley we'll talk about in a minute. What was, Chris Dundee in Miami was right. Angelo Dundee's brother, brother right? right? Right. So that's why the boxing, they had so many famous boxing matches in Miami, in Miami Beach. One of Cassius Clay's early right. fights was in Miami Beach. Well, that's listen, and the other guy that used to come to matches quite a bit, and he was afraid to death of wrestlers, was Jimmy Ellis. He was he was from Louisville too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was Ali's training partner. Yeah, and I think he ended up winning some form of the belt when uh, Ali went to exile. But he would come to the matches, and Chris was smart enough that he would bring fighters in, and I guess he he either smartened them up not to be jerks. Yeah, but they'd be going. You know what I mean? <laughs> I watch them. I'm saying they're overselling us maybe a little. You know what I mean? But. In the, invariably, they'd be in a fight at the end of the month themselves in the yeah. same building. So it was publicity for them. You know, and, and I mean, I'm sure they were, you know, probably preconditioned. They don't right. say anything. But at the same time, even a heavyweight boxer, when he's standing in front of Joe LaDuke, what are you going to say? Yeah. You know, he knocked yeah. the guy's profession. Yeah. He says, oh, yeah. pleased to meet you, sir. You know. Yeah. Um, any and, other local promoters? Yeah, I was just going to say, this guy uh, O'Hare, I'm trying to think of his first name, uh, Pat O'Hare. He had worked in New England and around the country as an Irish strongman. You know what I mean? I can remember a picture of me seeing him in Boston, which didn't run many pictures of wrestling, of him bending a shoe. He was one of those Joe LaDuke buddies, you know what oh I mean? Oh, my God, yeah. And he was a super guy. I mean, uh, you know, Jimmy, coming from where we had come from, Tennessee, I mean, yeah. promoters were brutal to us, right? I mean, most of them. You know, most of them were brutal. <laughs> well, you, and you, you, I never got to meet Nick Goulish. You oh, had to work for okay. Nick, too, so that, okay. was even, that was even worse. Uh, but this Pat O'Hare, he, he would uh, come in and his wife had, would have made sandwiches for the guys or cookies, and okay. he'd buy uh, a couple of ca uh, cases of, you know, shit beer, but it was beer in the, yeah. the thing, and couldn't drink it until after the matches or, and take what you want. Eddie just had a way of picking the right guy for the right town. And they took pride in going out like uh, Pat ran small towns like Palatka or Spacho if we needed it, yeah. you know what I mean? And they would go out and really hustle. They joined again, again, I just thought of this. They would get with the sheriffs, right, and sell tickets. Yeah. Well, maybe there's a eight thousand dollar house but there's only four thousand dollars worth of people in there you know what i mean the sheriffs would push the people to sell tickets and yeah. and they also wanted the local promoters a pat in the ass from eddie you know he's that big of personality you know well and also when, when you had weekly towns it this is something that's been lost in the wrestling business these days you can't run a house show without somebody in that town did the tv play properly right. did the promos play was the newspaper ad uh, put in place right uh, the the building the the contracts is are they going to have toilet paper in the bathrooms just all the things the advertising poster and right. this and that and that's why the successful territory guys would have a guy in in each town or one that spent some time in that town especially the weekly towns so that they knew what was going on and you didn't show up and everybody's there's nobody there and everybody's going well what happened right one guy was responsible for everything right and I think it was you know like we said about Nick, he would get these promoters like John Kazana, and he had no relationship with John, even though John on that territory yeah. by himself. Or, uh, you know, the Welshes, they had Dyersburg and Tupelo, or yeah. whatever they had. But there was no relationship. You know, you th these promoters knew if they got into a problem, they could call Eddie and say, hey, Eddie, I've tried my best to get this ad at X amount of dollars, and my budget's right here. Yeah. Do you think you can loosen up the purse strings and give me an extra? So, because I feel that this is going to do well, and then the house will do well again the next time. And Eddie would either say, invariably, he'd see it, either say yes, or I'll call you back. And Eddie would make a call, and he'd get a favor done. And he wouldn't have to pay for the ads, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> and he goes, Pat, go down there, and uh, they're going to give you the ad. Just go down there and sign off on it, you know? So, like you said, everybody 
it all came back to Eddie. The buck stopped here, yeah. and everybody was accountable for themselves, the promoters, the wrestlers, you know what I mean? Because, you know, he didn't, I, I'll tell you a story that this is before I was in the business. Valentine, who was one of the great draws of all times, and Red Bastine, blew the territory open. So Eddie was, uh, his neighbor came up to me and said, hey, I saw those guys on TV. He said, oh, good. He said, oh, no, no, I saw them down on the beach barbecuing together. Now they booked all week on top, and they've been doing big business, right? Yeah. Eddie went and called them and said, boys, pack your bags. I don't need your work anymore. Now, would that have happened in today's day and age? No. Okay, would it happen? Now they most, laugh at him. Oh, yeah, yeah go ahead. Would, they, would it happen back in those days with most promoters? They would say, well, we'll figure out a six weeks deal. Yeah, we'll we'll figure, yeah, as soon as they quit selling yeah, out, they're yeah, done. Yeah, Fuck them. Yeah. yeah, but Eddie, I mean, that's taking a chance, you know what I mean? Because now you got rid of the program. And not only you get rid of the program, I don't have to tell you, but a lot of people don't understand this. To get the guy to draw that way, he slotted some bodies on the way out, yeah. right? So yeah. now you got to, you know, hump now you got to rebuild the wounded yeah, soldiers yeah, yeah, after yeah. the, you know. But but at the same time, he was thinking five years from now, right? Because it's not about one guy seeing the big program right. barbecuing together down on the right. beach. It's about how how many times will that happen, and how many times will that guy tell, or people, and how many people that guy tell, and over a period of time, it grows. So just like when you when you look at talent, you don't look at if you're trying to build a territory right. and you're looking at young guys, you don't look at how they are now. You look at what they will grow into in three to five years. He was looking at, if I let this go on, the more times I let it go on, the wider spread it gets, the more damage it's going to do to my business in the long run. In five years, it's going to bite me in the ass because then everybody's smart, so I'm going to nip it to bud now. I'm going to tell you how it was just drilled into your head. Mike and I were partners, and Mike had never done a blade job. And you'll love this. You know what I had in my bag? One of the chisels you from got Tennessee. It. Oh. You got it. All, 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 <laughs> the Ron Wright yeah, chisel. Yeah, all, all uh, bloodied up for me and Ron and Don and Whitey Caldwell. I had it in my bag. So we were starting to work a program with Black Jack Slade. Do you remember him? I remember that name. I remember that and name. And Dickie Slater, who was a great performer, right? So Mike said to me, what's that? I said, well, you put it <laughs> on your hand and they bust you open. He said, whoa. He said, I'd like to do that. I said, what? He said, yeah, because I've never bled. If I bleed, I think it will help the territory. Well, this became the kayfabe. In two weeks, we're going to do it on TV. This is how conditioned the guys were. Black Jack Slade had a girlfriend. He had Slater over with his girlfriend, or soon-to-be wife. And they were having a couple of cocktails and eating. And Black Jack Slade's girlfriend said, Oh, I hear you're going to hit Mike with some kind of chisel. Dickie went right to Eddie. Slave was gone, and Mike never did it. God damn it, I wanted to see that. Because <laughs> my head was numb for six months. You know, but that's how, that's how everybody fell in line. And it wasn't Stoogin. You yeah. know, I mean, sometimes people say, well, that guy was a Stoogin. No, he was protecting his vested interest of the business and protecting it for Eddie, too, because, yeah. you know, the respect that he had. Well, now, let's talk about, we talked about television with Eddie Graham yeah. getting a Civic Award every week, but the television went through some changes over three decades, but Gordon Soley had come in in the late 50s. He did stock car racing, and right. he was had, obviously, the incredible vocabulary, the voice, the delivery, called it as a professional sport under, and he learned wrestling pretty much from Cowboy Luttrell and Eddie Graham all that right. time, too, so he was instructed to call it that way, and it fit his style perfectly. But uh, for the 70s and 80s, wh when and where did you tape television? And then it, and then it showed in every market in Florida right. with a television station. Right. So those, those stations overlap. So the television was all across the state. Everybody was an instant TV star because in the days where there right. was three stations in a market. But when and where did you do the TV and what was the process like? The, the TV was done Wednesday morning after Tampa off 
Fort Myers, if you had a drive back, it sucked, you know, yeah. but you're probably in better shape on Wednesday morning than going out in Tampa <laughs> your night. So it was shot at the office in front of a crowd that was maybe a hundred people, had bleachers on two sides, uh, actually three sides and chairs. Yeah. And the same people came Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock and... Uh, Try to get a hundred people now to go to a wrestling show Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. No. 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 And they got, they had to pay. They had to pay. Yeah. It was a couple of bucks, but they had to pay. And, uh, you know, and then you had to finish that TV and you either jumped immediately in the car or you go shower and go to the airport and take a plane and stay over and fly back because that's yeah. when the, they had uh, Florida Air or Air Florida. It was like $40 round trip to Miami. But, you know, uh, what I, you said about Gordon, and you go back, and I mean, J.R. is fabulous, okay? Yep. But Gordon, J.R. was kind of raised in the business, you know what I'm saying, right? It would watch, yep. he put up rings, he learned different things. Gordon was found at, a, at the stock car races, and Mike was the one that found him. He said, Dad, I like his voice, I think he'd be a good announcer. And Eddie went to him and said, do you know anything about it? And he said, no one good had told me this story. Eddie said to him, well, I want you to do it. Come to the office like on a Monday. And he said, we're going to go some, over some things. And he said to him, this is a legitimate sport. And I want you to produce it that way. I don't want any uh, tongue-in-cheek stuff. Because if you look back at the old stuff from Marigold Gardens, you would know who the announcers Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Jack Reynolds is, uh, yeah. I think it was his name. But, but Jack, was, Brickhouse. Jack, yeah. Brickhouse. Yeah. Jack Brickhouse. Jack Brickhouse. Jack Reynolds was in, in Cleveland. But, um, they, yeah, oh, look there, Bruiser yeah. Affless. Yeah. Well, he's got him in a hole there, doesn't he, folks? And yeah. it was, it was tongue-in-cheek, yeah. and it was kind of making mockery. But yeah. This was straight as an arrow. Yeah. Straight yeah. as you could get. And he had such a big influence down there that most people thought he was a part owner. You know what I mean? And uh, he was... And he was already in his, probably his, what, his 30s? I would say at least when he, yeah, when he started mid -30s, in Yeah, mid-30s, mid-30s, you know what I mean? And... Uh, for Maybe all, that was better. Maybe because he hadn't grown up in the business, and he was told as a grown adult here, this is called this legitimately. We're trying to give the illusion that this is completely straight. And because he had the vocabulary and the broadcasting ability, he was able to then study it and do it the right way instead of coming in with a preconceived. You know, I never notion. thought of it that way, Jimmy. But that does make a lot of sense. Because now right? it's it's the same thing as trying to teach the wrestlers these days. When you broke in the business 30 years ago or 40 years ago, you knew absolutely nothing about the way anything worked. Right. So when they would teach you, you were learning it from scratch. Now you can't train a wrestler anymore. You can't smarten them up because as soon as they get on the internet, they're smart to everything right. and they think they know and, and exactly what's going on. And it's harder to unlearn something and learn it the right way than it is to learn it from scratch. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you know, you look back at Gordon and all those characters that were there, I mean, Curtis, Lewin, uh, myself, uh, Abby, Brody, Hanson, I mean, we could go down the list, the <laughs> Sheik. He was in an invisible shield, yeah. surrounded by an invisible shield. You couldn't touch him. You were gonna lose your job if you went. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you something. Yeah. Hey. You, I mean, he, Eddie had it that I asked Eddie about that one time. He said, you ever see a football player come up and grab uh, Sh Shankle, what was his name? Uh, oh, Chris Shankle. Chris Shankle. He, uh, he said, did you ever see that happen? I said, no. He said, well, we're not gonna see it happen here either. Because let's face it, you know, it's like anything else. Coming up with an idea is very hard every week. Yeah. You know, and then you, you start to take the path of least resistance, right? Let's grab the announcer. That worked the first yeah, seven yeah, times yeah, we did yeah, it, and, yeah. and oh, well, nobody's ever done this before. Yeah, well, there's yeah. probably a reason why nobody's ever done that yeah, before. Yeah. It won't be good for you in the long run. Um, I, I love the TV at, uh, at uh, that they did at the office because it was kind of like an early OVW, and you could see when, when some of the guys got up on the top rope, there was that beam yeah. running across, right? Okay, yeah. we got to watch out for that. But it because there was no big budget wrestling programs at the time, it worked. Right. And the matches were so good and the people were screaming and yelling. 
it, it, it and, and the talent, uh, once again, uh, just from the 60s and the 70s, but it was a who's who of right. Florida because even if it wasn't the highest paying territory in the business, it was Florida. It was short trips, and you got a chance to work for a genius and be figured in. And if Eddie Graham wanted you to get over, as we'll talk about, you could go anywhere. But in the 60s alone, uh, the titles, the singles title, Boris Malenko, Hiro Matsuda, uh, Bob Wharton Sr., Cowboy Bob Ellis, Tarzan Tyler, Jack Briscoe, Wahoo McDaniel, and Johnny Valentine. Those yeah. guys built the Florida Territory on the tag team side, the Von Brauners. Yep. Uh, Don Curtis and Mark Lewin, Skull Murphy and Brute Bernard, Eddie Graham and Sam Steamboat, and the Infernos, who were hot all over the South. Um, yep. That's an incredible array of talent if you really want to concentrate on in-ring work. And if, if, if you really want to concentrate on guys that knew how to work programs, knew how to cut promos and draw money, that's a great way to establish a territory. But it, almost everybody at one time or another came through Florida, right? right? right. You, you had to. You had to. Everybody. I've got a program at home. The second match on the card is Boris Malenko versus Carl Gotch. And I wonder, yeah. <laughs> hopefully yeah. everybody was in a good mood yeah. that day. Yeah. Uh, then we go to the 70s. And you can talk about some of these okay. guys because you were in the ring with every single one of them. But look at this talent in one one state territory. Terry Funk, Dick Murdoch, Bobby Shane, Tim Mr. Wrestling Woods, Dusty Rhodes, Joe LaDuke, Cowboy Bill Watts, Harley Race, the Mongolian Stomper, Superstar Billy Graham, Ivan Koloff, Dick Slater, team of Rhodes and Murdoch, the Briscoes and the Funks as a team, Mike Graham and Kevin Sullivan, Mike Graham and Steve Kern. The in, incredible talent. Yeah, and the thing was, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and they talked about back in the heyday of the 90s, the guys didn't get it. There was a symbiotic relationship, like the guys that were working underneath thinking they should be working on top when these guys on yeah. top are making three million bucks a year. And if <laughs> if you, you were in Turner, if you sat them down, the North Tower is going to call you and say, what do you got this guy in the second match for? They don't care if he can't work, right? Yeah. So in Florida, there was a symbiotic relationship with the people, with the guys. Everybody knew because Eddie had laid it out. Okay, if Jack was going to wrestle Tim Woods, that night was a wrestling night. We put away any any over over the top violence, okay. Right. But if Terry Funk and Jack wrestled, they were going to have a violent match at the end. You know, yeah. Terry's going to hit him with a Brandon Iron or a dead chicken or something, right? <laughs> or a toilet seat. But you couldn't do anything on the floor that night. You know what I mean? Everybody was accountable for every time they got you in the You couldn't do anything on the floor because the first thing that a Funk was going to do was throw you out of the ring. <laughs> yeah. and Jerry Lawler told me one time, I worked with Dory Funk and Terry Funk, and I've never had anybody throw me out of the ring. They just one side, and you get in and throw them out the other side. Yeah. So that you knew, so you would build your card to have none of what they were going to get in the main event, so they'd wait for it and they'd see it. And Jimmy, again, I'm using the word accountable. He put it down that if you can't figure this out after I've told you, you're not here, you know what I mean? Yeah. He just had a way. And after a while, you kind of knew uh, that most of these guys here that you've mentioned, right, are going on, they're gonna use Florida, they're gonna produce un unbelievable matches, but the Funks are going back to Amarillo, Jack is gonna be the world, ta uh, world champion, Tim is going to end up going to back to Atlanta for Barnett. So you better get your ass ready because you're coming off the bench, you know yeah. what I mean? And if you're young and, and you're energetic and you follow this thing, when is it? it's you knew it was going to be your turn, so you didn't get the frustrated way you're saying, these guys are never going to let me get a shot at it. You know what well, I mean? Well, he, he, he popularized, at least in Florida, the, the package show, as yes. Watts would call it, and which would now would be a pay-per-view right. because it was the big show. Um, it, Florida towns were smaller in terms of population, right. the big, and they were there every week. So they instead of just relying on one main event, there'd be one clear main event. Here's right. what's supposed to draw the money, whether it's Dusty and Pac Song or Briscoe and Funk or whatever. But up and down the show... 
there would be different types of matches with different stipulations for different titles or different uh, rewards for the winner. And everybody had a little issue because that way, that was the package show and the big ones started becoming the, the super cards where they'd open up the Bayfront Center in St. Petersburg. Right. And they had 12,000 seats right. to fill in a weekly town. So they had to really, uh, you know, jack it up a little bit. But uh, Watts took that philosophy and went to the Superdome and Dusty took it and made Starcade. Right. And now it'd be called a pay-per-view, but that didn't exist back in those days. But when you talk about famous angles, in Florida, the first one that everybody talks about that got the whole thing off the ground was Eddie Graham, Boris Malenko, and right. False Teeth. Right. What did you hear about that? Because that was the mid-60s. You obviously weren't around. The no. I, was that like one of those things like in Louisville, everybody talks about the scaffold match with Jerry Jarrett and Don Green, even though they were five years old when it happened? Yeah. If everybody was there in Louisville that claims to have been there, it would have sold out Freedom Hall, 20,000 seats. Yeah. But, but it's legendary. Everybody remembers... Eddie Graham on television stomping uh, Boris uh, Malenko's false teeth, right. and they sold out, I guess, for weeks and weeks and weeks afterwards. But were they still talking about it then? Yeah, I mean, you know, I wasn't even in the business when they did that. And then I came in, and I met Boris for the first time, and then I heard about it, and like you said, everywhere I went, you know, now Boris was a babyface, everybody would say to me, oh, I used to hate that Malenko. I really liked it when Eddie busts yeah. his teeth. And like you said, here's an eight-year-old <laughs> kid telling me this, you know. He couldn't have possibly seen it. So, yeah. And it sounds so so hokey, really. Okay, yeah. the baby face stomped the heels false <laughs> teeth, but the way that they did it. And then Malenko crusaded uh, trying to get Graham to pay for the teeth. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, he was trying to get him suspended or whatever. But they made it seem legitimate and think about if 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 somebody really did knock your false teeth out of your mouth and stomp on him you'd probably be mad that'd be a reason to fight but the the next thing that everybody remembers or thinks of florida about is was probably a little more serious that was they took it all over the country but jack briscoe and dory funk jr right. it was for 1969 to 73 it was the flare and steamboat of that time right. it was the gold standard in the ring the two best in the world at what they did, was Eddie Graham, because it's no secret that the Briscoe family and the Funk family had some enmity, was, was yeah. the word, there was a little tension there. Right. Is there heat? <laughs> I can feel it. It's not scalding, <laughs> yeah. but it's there, yeah. Austin Idol. Yeah. Um, Eddie Graham, Jack Briscoe was his protege. Right. At the same time, Dory Funk Jr. and Terry Funk were like extended members of the family Absolutely. because he had worked for their father and their father had taught him. So he was the one that could get in there and get the best out of both of them. And still to this day, I guess that the one hour show, which still exists on tape, I've got a copy of Jack and Dory sitting down with Eddie Graham and Gordon Soley and discussing their one hour draw in St. Petersburg. Right. You watch that and you think, this was a legitimate sporting contest between two wrestlers that just happened to be professionals instead of amateurs, and they were serious about it. Yeah. And they drew money in every NWA territory in the country just by coming in cold sometimes, whether it be St. Louis or whatever, place they didn't even work. Main event, boom, for the title, Briscoe Funk, and they drew money. That was Eddie Graham's, even though he didn't wrestle like that as a wrestler, yeah. and I'm droning on here now, he was a brawler, he was right, a fighter, threw right, the great right. right punch, but he loved that kind of wrestling, and that's what he presented really the best, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely, and you know, uh, when you say, when you just said that to me, you know, Briscoe and Funk, it's Ali and Frazier. Yeah. They both needed each other, you know what I mean? And the interesting thing about that thing you saw, the uh, hour Broadway, they came back two months later and went 90 minutes. And... Ah. You know, in Florida, you didn't have to stay and watch the matches. But when Briscoe and Funk came in, everybody stayed. Yeah, everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was the most legitimate feel I ever saw in my life to any wrestling match. And I'm not diminishing Steamboat and Flair at all, but it was a different thing. You know, you, still, you still had Rick. Being Rick, this was an athletic contest between Florida and Texas. And Texas, and, and, and also uh, to be honest, to be fair to both Rick, right. uh, both Ricks, Flair and Steamboat, 
Neither one of them were an NCAA wrestling champion, right. so Briscoe had a little leg up in working a a worked, legitimate contest. Right. And Dory, because of his training and his father and etc., you know, he was one of the guys that could hang. Well, I'm sure you know this, Jimmy. They used to. Uh, this this was way ahead of its time, okay? And I, I used to think, where are they going to take this? You know, and they kind of didn't go anywhere. But they would have the Funks against uh, the Briscoes in Florida in a tag match, yeah. right? And they would send that tape back, and they would re-audio the tape so the Funks were baby faces in Amarillo. In Amarillo, yeah. And they and would send it back the other way. Then they would do it in Amarillo and send it back with the, you know, uh, Funks were heels. And they did a thing one time that was, you know, we talked about subtle things. Do you remember the angle with the father mistakenly hitting the bell? The, yes, yes, but what, what, were, what were the details? What the, were the details? The thing was, it was for Dory's belt. Yeah. And Jack went in for the figure four, but it was about 58 minutes. And, you know, supposedly seniors getting excited and excited and excited. And he goes over by mistake. He hits the big gong, right? Like the gong. Yeah. <laughs> gong. The referee calls it off, right? And then the, they had the guy make him believe uh, Stanley Blackburn, right? Yeah. He's saying, no, 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 there's two minutes left. There's two minutes left. Junior rolls out of the ring, limping around. And Dory Cena's yeah. like, oh, I didn't mean I to didn't hit mean that. To yeah, 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 yeah. And, I mean, that little thing. Uh, you know, then Eddie came and made a promo, uh, and they had a thing from uh, Telegram. You know, back in those days, Telegrams were big. Sam Mushnick, we're looking into this. We're going to ban uh, Funk Sr. from ever being at ringside in any arena yeah. in the United States. And, in fact, next week, uh, we've banned Terry Funk for Russ, uh, being on a card with uh, Briscoe and Funk, right? I mean, Dory and yeah. Jack. So right away you're thinking, oh, the belt's going to change now. They don't, they're not in here, right? And that's how they got into the 60 minutes. Well, and then, to be honest, nobody knows yet, and Eddie Graham was in the middle of that when, I know. when Dory was supposed to drop the belt to, to Jack, and then word came from uh, Texas that Dory had had a, a truck, wreck. truck wreck on the ranch, yeah. herding some cattle, turned over in a, a gully, and had, they sent pictures of him in the hospital, right. in the sling, etc., that's kind of what started the issue with the Briscoe family right. because he don't want to put me over. Right. And then just to make sure when they got Dory back in the ring, that's why it went from Dory to Harley and then Harley to, right. to Jack. It, Eddie had to be in the middle of that. And there's right. Jack is his homemade hometown boy, you know, his oh. homemade protege. What? He was bullshit. Was he it? was absolutely bullshit. And I can remember him saying, again, this is when I was uh, really close to him. I heard him yelling, and very seldom did Eddie yell, you know. I heard him yelling at the phone to Mushin, this is bullshit, this is bullshit. And he said to him, everybody thinks it was because old man Funk didn't want Dory to lose to a baby face. You know that, right? Yeah. That's what yeah. everybody thinks. It had to be a, there was it something had to be a heel, right? That yeah, was the story. Yeah, yeah, it had to be yeah. a heel. But. He didn't want to lose to a that he wasn't the best wrestler, Yeah. okay? But there's a little bit more to this story. And you'd be the guy to find out. You know, at that time, they started booking opposition in Japan, the Funks. Remember? They they went, that's when they went to New Japan. That's right, because So it, here's yeah. what they wanted to do. They wanted to send Dory over there to defend the belt because they wanted to have a tournament for the belt. Do you remember that? They were going to have a tournament? Yes, yes. They were going to have a tournament, and Holly was going to win, or Jack was going to win. It didn't matter or yeah. for Old Man Funk. Whoever won the tournament was champion. But Junior was going to go over there as the undefeated NWA champion and give them credibility, even though at that time, Anoki uh, uh, wasn't in the and NWA. that's where he ended up going because did they had they had an hour draw Dory yeah, and Anoki yeah, at some yeah, point yeah, seventy three yeah, or whatever yeah, and that's yeah. on one of those compilation tapes. Yeah, yeah. So there was more to it than just that, and this was like, and you know that Eddie Graham would have not 
let anything happen to the NWA relationship with Giant Baba. Right. So, okay. And uh, uh, that's where I think that sometimes there's always more to the story, like Paul Harvey, the rest yeah. of the story. It wasn't just losing in the tournament. Because if you look at it, really, if you look at it on paper, what a house you draw, right? With the uh, uh, one-night tournament yeah. with Briscoe, Terry, Harley. You know, you could throw anybody in there at that time, too. Well, you know, uh, Kaniski, Thez could come out of retirement. You could yeah. throw. You're going to sell out. It wasn't so much that, I don't think, that Eddie saw. He saw them taking the belt that Jack's going to have. Even though it isn't and around his waist, the lineage. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, and it wasn't around his waist, but he's the undefeated NWA champion. Now you give him legitimacy to Anoki. Now Bob is going to be pissed, right? Yeah, now they're trying to, you know. So it was the following year. I get that was '73 title changes. So it was '74. If you got to talk about one Florida angle, right? It's the American Dream. Oh. It's Dusty Gary Hart pack song, which started. In an angle with Jack Briscoe, and I'm going to start it and let you take it from there because okay. you were there. But but wasn't it the situation where Eddie? In, they always say, "Let the people call it. Let the people want to be a, a guy to turn baby face or right. want something to happen before you do it and then do it." Well, Eddie was so smart that he was able to see Dusty and see the charisma he had, and put him in a position where the people on their own would start calling for it, and then he gave them what he, like he's the finish earlier, right? right? right. He, he gave them his finish, and it was their own idea. It was the people's idea to, for Dusty Rhodes yeah. to be a baby face because he led them down that path, and part of it was Dusty able to last with Jack Briscoe, right. and then Gary Hartz got upset about it, and how did they go into the thing from there, and what do you remember about it? Okay, now, the only time I've ever, it was not like Dusty's, but you remember when Steiner turned babyface? The people yeah. wanted him yeah. to be babyface, okay? It got to be that everything that Eddie orchestrated was, like you said, the people demanding him to be babyface. I'd never yeah. seen anything like it in my life. But now he goes through with Jack Briscoe on TV. They did that thing on TV. That's remember? right, time limit draw. He goes to the time limit draw with the Golden Child, right? And then Gary gets involved in it. You know what I'm saying? That was Gary pushing him around. And then they got, Mike came out and Dusty saved Mike because Pac Song went to go to do the chop and Dusty jumped in front of Mike and Pac Song Sacrificed chopped himself. You got it, you yes. got it, yeah. He, and Dusty and, loved that too. He used that spot for years after. And, I loved it. And you know what was crazy about it? You know, we all know Dust, right? And I love him. But you know the stories they'll tell you about people hawking tickets, selling, scalping tickets in Miami and every place around? Yeah. That was true, I saw it. Everything was sold out. This is 74, right? Yeah. This is 74. I saw people selling tickets for $200, buying tickets in 74. <laughs> he was so over. I mean, it was, he was like a rock star. But he had, you know, I always mention, you know, there's only a few great managers. Of course, you're one of them, and Gary. Gary knew was how fantastic. To, Gary was fantastic. And with the foreign menace, Pak Song Nam, mm -hmm. the evil Pak Song Nam. We are just leaving Vietnam with our ass kicked, yeah. right? Yeah. And now they were hot. Big national embarrassment. Here's yeah. this giant. Pak Song Nam. <laughs> Vietnamese it, with, with uh, the glandular disease yeah. and the huge face. And... And that's why Dusty didn't fit in with Gary's guys also because Gary had the pack songs and the kabukis and the foreign menaces right. and it, the real bad guys. And then here come Dusty Rhodes, you have any psychedelic <laughs> superstar, baby. Yeah. And it didn't fit anyway. And Dusty was also nobody, none of Gary's guys usually did their own talking. Yeah. And then Dusty comes and starts doing the promo. So it was almost made he doesn't fit. And the yeah. people are screaming, this doesn't fit. This he, doesn't fit. He, he, he's the American dream and he's yeah. tag team partners with a... Vietnamese guy. But the thing about Pak Song that everybody forgets, I'm sure you've seen the tapes, Jimmy. You know, we've seen guys like Tanaka, Toro Tanaka break the uh, bricks. Yeah. He was breaking stones. He was a legit deal. You know, like a river stone? Yeah. He'd break that in half. So people bought in that he was Pak Song Nam, you know what I mean? 
And that angle, actually that angle ended my run because Mike went with Dusty and I went off into New York, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you went. Yeah, and I went, I went. But now, look, and, and I know so much of it was Dusty's and T.C. Lee, the ditch digger that, you know, he worked yeah. with. T.C. Lee was a real person, at least Dusty says, and yeah. his, his father really was a plumber. Yeah. But the promos were Dusty's, but how much of the guidance and the direction was Eddie? How much of him was saying, okay, son, you can, you can talk, but here's what you need to say? I, or did he just open the door for him and let him just... Well, he opened the door for him and let him just do it. Yeah. But if Eddie wanted something specifically in there, he would give him guidelines. Yeah. You know what I mean, he'd say, okay, everything he's doing is right on. But is there a way you can, without coming out and overtly saying this, can you say that you're not going to pull out like we did in Vietnam? You know what I mean? Yeah. He'd yeah let yeah. him think that. You know, so he gave Dusty <laughs> something to think about. But, I mean, you know, it was such, I mean, I can remember when he turned, okay? And the first time him and Mike were on TV, they did a, a pop song and somebody were going to, they were going to wrestle on TV, right? Yeah. And they went off the air immediately. I was downtown in Tampa, and you could hear the television st stations like it was someone preaching on the radio. Gordon <laughs> Sully's voice was all over. I mean, I was going, what the hell is this? I mean, that was such, I don't think, you know, in my life I ever saw that intensity of anything. I mean, he just, it boomed. I mean, it was, okay, well, they were doing big money, but now they're scalping tickets. You yeah. know what I mean? And one, one and, turn. And it, even Dusty and, and all great men and great performers do have egos, right. but even Dusty wasn't about to say, no, Eddie, I, I don't think I ought to do that. It's not yeah. right for me, baby. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. No, he was yeah. going to do whatever. Yeah. And I've, I had friends, you know, because that's just at, at that point in time where I was really starting to trade programs and magazines and things back and forth, and I had friends in Florida say, you've never seen anything like this. You've never yeah. seen anything like this. And, I, and finally, uh, you know, then I would travel and I got to see him on TBS. <laughs> uh, on the cable show in like 76 and he's doing the promo and wearing the outfits. I'm like, this is insane uh, because it doesn't look like it should work, but it works perfect. Well, I'll show you how, how, again, how Eddie was so on top of things. Remember I told you about five minutes ago about the bet with Vince? Yeah. He didn't want Vince to flop. So he suggested Superstar and Dusty in the bull rope. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. He, he because the cards underneath Backlund yeah. were always Jimmy stacked. Jimmy Snooker. Bruno mm -hmm. could have Crusher Verdue on yeah. top and nobody in underneath, and it was fine. But yeah. he stacked the cards because that's the way you made sure that the perception of your main event star was that he was drawn. Yeah. So whether it's Andre or whether it's Bruno back for a special match or whether it's a Superstar Billy Graham against Dusty Rhodes. Well, you told me one time, Eddie Graham would call Vince McMahon Sr. and say, "Can you take Dusty?" For just yeah. you know, for a couple of weeks, I got to get somebody else over down here, yeah. and you couldn't get anybody else over as long as Dusty Rhodes was still there. Nobody could get over Dusty. Well, it, Terry and I have talked about this too. Uh, Terry would say to me, uh, Eddie would have to get Dusty out of there. I mean, he just had it because it was a log jam. You know what yeah. I mean? No one was going around them, and no one was going to replace him, and he knew that. But he'd send them up to Barnett when Barnett started running, you know, Columbus and Michigan and all that. Right. But all the time he was doing that, he was also going to Houston. He was going to St. Louis. He was going up to Vince. And then Eddie would try to get some guys over, and they would do fairly well, you yeah. know. But the people would be clamoring for Dusty to come back, you know what I mean? And as soon as he came back... But that's the thing. They were clamoring for him to come, come back. Come back. How can I miss you yeah. if you yeah. won't go yeah. away? Yeah. And it's just though in those days, you had a place to send guys so yeah. you could protect your investment. Right. So, well, he's getting a little little stale over here, even though Dusty, it was hard to get stale yeah. at that time. But any any regular talent. Yeah. Get a little stale over here, but if I send him to... X for a few weeks or a few months, and he comes back, and rock and roll leaves Louisiana, comes back Tennessee for 90 days, goes right. back. Oh, they're so happy. Um, during these hot periods like this in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s was hot, what was the money like for the top guys? In the state of Florida, home almost every night if you wanted to be, sun, fun, beaches, I'm, weather. J.J. and I talked about this in the early 80s in Florida. 
the guys, I'm sure when Dusty did this in 74, he was making 150000 In the 80s, you know, you were making $100,000 if you were working with Dusty. Yeah. And, uh, 1974, that's 40 years ago. Right. $150,000 for those guys figured into that, that thing. That would be five hundred grand now, probably. Yeah, at in, least, in, yeah. As they say, as the kids say these days, today's money. Yeah, yeah. And in, in one state. And I mean, yeah. of course, now, uh, like Dusty, at that point uh, in the mid-70s, when he started going to Atlanta and he started going to other places, he wasn't making quite as much from Florida, but he was making more because he was starting to cherry pick his shots. Yep. Ole Anderson, we uh, talked to him in Charlotte last year, uh, booking the Carolinas and being a booker and uh, talent uh, and a, a top talent in uh, Atlanta. Also, at the same time, he was making two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in the late seventies. Right. And I think you know a lot of the guys these days. Uh, that's what they would aspire to now in two thousand fifteen. But they think that Vince created big money in wrestling. The big money for the majority of people in wrestling was actually before. Absolutely. Vince McMahon got his hands on it. Um, well, Jimmy, I want to just throw something out at you. I read this just you know uh, after I read your book, I read some excerpts from Thez's book, right? When he went to wrestle uh, Ricky Dozan, yep. he went for six weeks, 12 matches, back in 53. Dozan paid him $300,000. And, and I read Lou's, uh, you may have seen, the, there's a YouTube clip where he's running on the beach where he had that hotel, and right? You know yes, what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. And if you watch him when he's running on the beach, he's saying, I, I'm working about two days a week now. I've cut back. I'm making 5000 a week on a bad week. These guys just make huge money. when the Well, in, in Chicago, the Dumont Network Television, and that's we're going to cover that in another edition of Back to the Territories, but the U.S. champion, Vern Gagne, right. who was made by Fred Kohler, who ran the Chicago TV, was the only other touring champion besides Thez in the NWA title. He got the same deal. Instead of the NWA and Thez, it was Ganya got 10% of the house. Wow. And Kohler got 3% uh, for the booking fee instead of Barnett for the NWA. Getting, yeah. So so the point is, even at 2 and $3 tickets, when he was going to buildings that were drawing five and six and eight and 10,000 people, whether it be Chicago or Milwaukee or wherever, Ten, that's fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a day on some of these shows. Point is, the top five uh, money-earning athletes in the United States, pro athletes in the early fifties, were the world heavyweight boxing champion and four pro wrestlers: yeah. Gordis George, Vern Gagne, Luthez, and somebody else. The TV stars. Yeah. The team sports didn't even compare. So, anyway, going back to the original question. Long story short, too late. Yeah. Guys were making six figures, working in the state of Florida in the 70s yeah. and in the 80s. And that also was helpful for their career because they knew as well get protégés. Eddie Graham had so many protégés. Jack Briscoe, Bill Watts, Dusty Rhodes, yourself. Briscoe, he knew as an NCAA champion, right. was going to be an All-American boy from Oklahoma, great amateur wrestler, clean cut, good look. He groomed him, and it included sending him out to Amarillo so he could right. do jobs for Dorian Terry, right. you know, right. and, which led to some lasting uh, issues. Bill Watts was a protege in terms of he had already been in the business for 10 years, but he learned to book there. Right. Um, Dusty was a protege in that he and Dick Murdoch had already been main event guys as the Texas Outlaws, and he already kind of had a clue what he was doing with his his deal, but he was shaped in Florida and then made so hot that they were scalping tickets and he was right. shitting on Jackie Gleason's toilet. Yeah. Um, yourself, who had been in the business in a variety of positions as talent, but actually got a chance to sit in and right. listen to these things and book and match make. He had so much impact on some. Can you think of other people that sat under that learning I'll, tree? I mean, everybody that I'll, ever worked there, but I'll, specifically. I'll tell you one that if he didn't have an accident, Jimmy, We'd be talking about him being the smartest. Bobby Shane? Bobby Shane, by far. He just had it. And the other one was uh, Dickie Slater. 
You know, when he was in, in that real bad wreck and he hit his head? Oh, car wreck, okay, yeah. He never was the same. I mean, he, he, he it did something to him, okay? Is, he had he a, just watched a videotape of Terry Funk and then he had the car wreck and yeah. when he woke up he thought he was Terry? Or yeah, I think so. <laughs> but I'm, I'm telling you, he, he knew how to work the day he came into the business. He knew how to manipulate. He knew how to do angles. He was a big, burly guy, and he would get the baby face over before he ever threw a punch, you know what I mean? And when he kicked it in gear, the only guy I ever saw do the similar thing to him, kick it in gear and take yeah. it to a different level, Paul Orndorff. Yeah. Everybody, exactly from, everybody from Florida that made it really made it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because they got to see all this great talent, and they got to see it in a different way. I, I'd well, watch. Uh, Orndorf, when Orndorf was a rookie, uh, Eddie sent him up to Memphis to work for Jerry Jarrett. And right. they put the belt, Lawler worked with him, Lawler could work with anybody whether they had a right. match or not, and they put the belt on him there for a brief time as his first title. But they showed the footage of Orndorf and Bob Backlund working out in the gym where they did that thing where they did the back bridge, but their legs were entwined, and then they were doing sit-ups <laughs> okay. with it. It looked like yeah. inhuman yeah. shit. And these guys are real athletes. Holy yeah. shit. Two weeks of that, and Paul Orndorff was made by the time he got in the ring, and then they put him over David Schultz and some underneath heels. Yeah. One minute, one minute, one minute, and four weeks later, he's Lawler for the title. Boom, one punch, knockout. Boom, wins the belt, and all of a sudden, he's over in a month. Yeah. And, you know, that's the, those guys, he had such great raw material, such clay to work with. Yeah, and you know, you said something that just jumped out at me. They were all athletes. Slater could have played. He, you know, he got uh, could have played for the Miami Dolphins. Yeah, the he, he was wrestler. a hot shot football player. Yeah, uh, and he was a very good amateur wrestler. Paul Orndorff. I mean, he he, he went to the pros football. Yeah. I mean, you look at it. Jack Briscoe, Gerald Briscoe. I mean, the basics, uh, the funks. You know what I mean? They all brought legitimacy to the business, especially that's what Eddie wanted. And I find it very ironic. All these guys that were buff and national champions <laughs> and all that, it ended up with Dusty being the biggest one. Maybe yeah. because it was he different. It was different. Yeah. If you got a ring full of seven foot guys, you haven't got yeah. any giants. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, we talked about Eddie's influence on the NWA and on the other promoters. He had not only a vote, but one of the votes yeah. on the world title, right? Right. right. Um, we talked about the fact that people would call him to, not only for finishes, but to settle disputes. If there was a fight between two other promoters, everybody wanted to know what, what Eddie said. Uh, we talked about the Jarrett and Goulas thing, the relationship with Vince Sr. So there was that, you know how I figured out there was some kind of something going on between Florida and the WWWF? I was a big newspaper right. clipping trader, right? See what yeah. the lineups were. And I discovered that the layout, layouts of some of the Florida ads were the exact same layout. pattern as the layout of some of the WWWF ads. All the way up, I'm like, there's something going with the, on here. With the picture of Bruno. Or yeah, the picture they, uh, yeah, exactly. Just Cowboy, different, different yeah. names, yeah. but the same, yeah. you know. Was it just something that they, uh, there had never been an NWA WWWF unification title match until they did them in Florida. Right. And he, Eddie Graham was able to get, it was, one of them was Superstar Graham and Harley Race. I was on that show. Were you, yeah. that, was, that, was that when the Orange Bowl? Or yeah, was that, that was the Orange Bowl. Tell yeah. me about that. Well, Holy I, shit, what a, you know, I mean, that, a match that took 25 years to put together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what I remember about it that was different to me, okay? Eddie brought them into, the Orange Bowl was a, in a horrible section of town. You know, it's where they played the we, national. We, we went there once we did the 86 bash there. Okay, it was, yeah, it yeah. Was, oh, it was okay, brutal. So it you was know, like another country, yeah. Yeah, and you remember all the little uh, enclaves and alleyways and yep. different places you could go and get lost and not even get to the ring, you know, if you took the wrong turn. You bump into Igor, or is that Igor? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, they, they were actually on the street outside the the stadium, like middle of the day, because we got there early, they were actually cooking some type of, <laughs> of animal and <laughs> selling it on sticks out yeah. there. It looked apparently unlicensed also, just from what I could tell. It was a strange neighborhood. Anyway. He took race and... And I thought this was funny, because he took race and superstar in enclave by themselves. 
nobody else was there, you know, and usually maybe Dusty would be there or, yeah. you know, one of his guys. But And the other thing that I thought was strange, here we are and we're north Miami, right? And Vince's house is 15 minutes away and Vince wasn't was there. Anyone there? there. Yeah. So I'm sure Eddie had gone to Vince's house, asked Vince what he wanted, and Vince said to him, well, this is what I want, Eddie. How do we get there? I'm sure they got the particulars. And I'm sure, in my head, Vince wouldn't have done it with anybody else but Eddie because yeah. of the double crosses, right? Yeah, because that... Yeah, it could have been... been Har Harley Race superstar Graham. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's much doubt there what's going to take yeah, place if, yeah. you know, if it had to be that way. Yeah, and I think that... Uh, Eddie was so close to Vince that Vince said, I don't even have to go. I'm sure it's going to be okay. You know what I mean? And, he, I, and then on the other hand, Vince was smart enough that if I go, that's a red flag, right? Yeah. But they, I saw, if you watch the tape, Superstar does a lot more wrestling than I ever saw him do. You know, and Eddie yeah. said, hey, this is prestige. You know, you, you're going to act like these are, this is, the real deal. Yeah. Uh, one of you could lose, and you could unify this belt. Because I think Eddie saw somewhere down the line, if Vincent Senior had lived, yeah. that there could have been a huge unification match oh. on closed yeah. because closed, closed circuit, circuit at was the just time starting, was, yeah. right. So I think that's how what happened, and they had a very good match. And remember, they had the count out with the yeah. blood and. The, the whole and they did. They did a couple of them still in yeah, Florida, and yeah. Backlund did one Back also. I wrestled Backlund on different. Did you really? Yeah, I wrestled Backlund <laughs> for the WWF title in uh, Atlanta twice, and I wrestled them in uh, uh, Miami once. But again, you know what we talked about? You know, even though that was the match, right? Yeah. The match under us was Dusty and Ole in a cage. Yeah. You know what I mean? So Eddie would protect Vince. Did they do WWF, NWA title versus title anywhere else but Florida? Now I'm trying to think. Was there? The, I, I think, yeah, they, did, they didn't do uh, NWA. They did AWA against WWF in Montreal. Yeah. And they were all going to Houston at the same time because yeah. yeah. everybody worked for Paul. Yeah. Nick had an interest yeah. and, yeah. you know, et cetera. And I think... Uh, they might have had the uh, AWA champion against the WWF champion in yeah. Uh, Houston. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, or maybe it was AW. Maybe it was Nick and Harley. Anyway, yeah. regardless. Right. Moving on. Yes. Um, we talked about the the style and the image of the promotion. It was a mix of of scientific wrestlers and chaos, right. and but it was all logical, incredible, and it 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 fit the presentation. Do you think that the, I guess a loaded question, do you think either would have worked without the other? Maybe I'm answering my own question. Do you think just all, all scientific wrestling wouldn't have worked and all brawling would have got old real quick? That's how he was able to keep it different because if he had a brawl at the top of the card, it would be scientific underneath. And if he had a right. wrestling match, they'd do a little more fighting, but they, it, it managed to complement each other. Now they have hardcore promotions. They have a lucha yeah. promotion. They have a wrestling promotion. They have a sports entertainment promotion. And we're just whacking up the same size pie in smaller pieces. But then he was able to please everybody. Is it just because of the difference in fans and wrestlers? Or? No, I think that he he saw, uh, he used to say to me, you know, we know each other forever, Jimmy. You know, and sometimes I'll paint off the easel. You know, I cut off my hair, yeah. Van Gogh. He would say <laughs> to me, and this is when I was booking there too, he'd say to me, uh, we're going to have scorched earth and nothing will grow. That was his <laughs> cue to me to pull it in, you know? Mm -hmm. A little bit more wrestling, Kevin. Don't scorched get so earth and nothing will grow. Yeah. That's a perfect way to put it. Yeah. And once you've burned it, yeah. you burn it. Yeah. And uh, I think that one of the things that you brought up early in the interview was where he came from. He came from Amarillo in Texas, and that was the wrestling, right? Yeah. Wrestling from Texas, right? Was that, that Wild and Woolly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then he went up to New York, 
where there was a little bit more wrestling, but him and Dr. Jerry were causing riots all over the place. Yeah. And then he saw, well, you can only go so far, and now if I own the territory, I don't want to get sued for all this stuff, so let's bring it back just a little, you know what I mean? Just a drama. Just, yeah, just bring it back a little. And okay, we got King Curtis and Mark coming in. Okay, <laughs> six months, six months, and we'll let them go to, back to Australia. But let's be prepared when they go that, you know, you know, sift it out, put a handle on it, yeah. make sure they don't burn, you know, everything up. Uh, he just had Stop this. Stop the blood for a little while. Yeah, he just had it. Oh, yeah. When uh, Curtis and Lewin left, there was no blood for a while. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because why? Why yeah, would you, yeah, you know? Yeah, and uh, he just had this ungodly feel to the business. I think, Jimmy, he started very young, what, 15 or 16? Yeah. I think when you're that so deep in it, that was his only rec uh, relief was the wrestling business. You know what I mean? He in it was he was so absorbed with it that he I'm sure that him and I could love to have been in a bunch of conversations with him and Terry and him and Dory Senior. They must have been some great conversations, <laughs> you know what I mean? But those guys, wrestling was their life. You know what I mean? It was so deep. When did you take the book first time? The first time was when I, I said back in 74, he let me, ha me and Dickie have the uh, Fort uh, Myers. And then the first time I took the book was in uh, about 82, I became Dusty's assistant. Then in 85, I took the book until Jimmy bought it out. Well, the 80s, there were changes. There were fresher talent, but yeah. still you had... Dusty, obviously, but Barry right. Windham, come right. on. David Von Erich, they sent yeah. David over there, and that's where he got a chance to be a heel, and, and they were grooming him, right, right for the NWA yeah. title. He was going to go to Florida, be a heel. Then he was already in St. Louis, and then... Yeah. Was the Missouri champion, which we talked yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, you were still there, but now you'd gone from a smiling and happy <laughs> baby face to an evil person who bore no resemblance to the... Yeah. Uh, Wahoo McDaniel, Lex Luger popped up right there right. just at the last. Dory was still around. Mike Rotunda and Wyndham were a good team. Ron right. Bass and Black Bart. The Young Bloods. The Zambui Express, one of my favorite tag teams. <laughs> Not necessarily for match quality, but just for name and sheer gross poundage. Um, the early 80s were still hot, though, and, and right. I especially I remember, the once again, the Funks and Briscoes had a nice little program on TV down there, and, right. and you know, it, the names were changing, but Florida Wrestling still had uh, cachet in the community, as they say. How, right. When you first, I remember Dutch told me he booked Florida, I guess. Yeah, after, right after was, me. Right after you and after Eddie had, had died, and... and he said, hell, he said, I could have done better, but they didn't tell me when I was booking these big shows, they didn't tell me I could just say we could raise the ticket prices whenever we, you know, yeah, the championship yeah, prices. Yeah. He didn't know that. Yeah. He said, Dusty told him one time, what, kid, just raise the prices. Yeah. Well, fuck, I didn't know I could do that, Dream. <laughs> um, what, did, what did you, when you first got the book the first time of the whole territory, right. what did you find out, what did you learn that you had not known that you didn't know up until that point? Well... I think uh, what I learned that I didn't know was, uh, and I don't know why I didn't, because I was there when it started, was how powerful TBS was. You yeah. know what I mean? Because I didn't have cable at that time, you know? And I saw how to see an encroachment on it was Tommy Rich. That was the first. Yeah. And then uh, they sent me up there to go on a tour. Uh, because they wanted you to get your face to come back into Florida. So I went on a tour, and it was the first tour they went on to Columbus, Ohio. Tommy Rich was like the Beatles. The girls were throwing their underwear in the ring. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> it was like, whoa, they were sold out. They popped when the guys locked up for the first time. So I started to say, wow. And they hadn't seen live wrestling up there since the Sheik had folded yeah. up like, what, five, six years yeah. before? So it was uh, like they, they used to say a virgin crowd again, which right. is another thing we can't ever find is a virgin crowd anymore. <laughs> They've all been deflowered in very brutal fashion. But I saw that, you know, the only way to stop this machine being, and it was, you know, again, 
six oh five to eight oh five. What a time slot, yeah. right? Because on the East Coast, you're going out on a Saturday night. You sat down. You had a beer. You're watching this. You know, wait. Oh, gee, I, I'm gonna go. I'll be. I will be way there. Yeah, let's watch this. You know, yeah. that kind of thing. The only way they could have, and was the time they went to Memphis and we were doing those. Try to do yeah. that. That, that didn't work. No. Because of all the egos, you know that, right? Well, we, we were at the Great American Bash 86. That's the, the one I remember was the worst. There was a couple of stinkers, a couple of great ones, a couple of stinkers, but the worst one was Memphis. At Li we're at the Liberty Bowl Stadium next door to the Mid-South Coliseum. It yeah. seats 11,000. Yeah. Liberty Bowl seats 70,000, and I think we had two, 2,000 yeah. people. Yeah. Because we're, Jerry Lawler wasn't on the cart. Right. And Lance Russell didn't tell us about it on TV Saturday morning. So right. people in Memphis weren't buying it. Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, we don't give a shit. Right. Could be the second coming of Luth as in, you know, Frank Gotch. Right. But it, it, at, the, at the period, the early 80s, that's, you know, with all the changes that everybody knows about, Vince starting to expand right. just at that point, the people starting to get a glimmer of smartness, right. and the promoters helping them along quite a bit later right. on. It, it, business stayed up for a while there, but it started, was that what, and I hate to get into the morbid stuff, but... Eddie's death obviously was sudden and somewhat controversial, and you've told me a few stories about it. But it, the wrestling business was his business was still fairly solid. His business was fairly solid, and uh, he got into you know a land problem that they had. Uh, the story I got from a pretty reliable source was Mike. They bought some property. And they were going to put a loop around Tampa, you know, yeah. on I-4. I think it's 204, 240 now. Well, they, someone in the county gave them the specifics where it was going to happen, okay? Eddie put the money up. And the guy that was his partner was a crook. And it was nothing but a scam. They, they had the people in the commission scam Eddie. Ugh. And, uh, you know, he could have faced some jail time. And I think, you know, there's been all kinds of surmising what happened, but I think I saw him from going, he was uh, sober for 17 years. I was there, he shotgun to beer. I went, whoa, you know, it was right off the cliff. And I, I think with whatever haunted him, We'll never know, Jimmy. Yeah. But the thing that I always remember, Florida's the last per place that Vince Jr. invaded. He didn't yeah. go to Florida until... You're right. Yeah, until, until Eddie, probably until after Eddie was Eddie, dead yeah, at that yeah, point. Yeah. yeah, he didn't go. And Do you I, think even Vince said, well, my dad would roll over in his grave if I try to fuck Eddie? You know, you know? I, I kind of think that it was like... Yeah, he might have thought that, but he was going to go eventually. But I think he was going to do it where he was thinking, because of my dad's relationship with Eddie, maybe he'll have no access to talent, things will go wrong, and I can buy him out like I bought the Calgary out, yeah. those different territories. I think that's what he would have done because... You know, Eddie was so well connected. It wouldn't take Eddie but a phone call to stop a show. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. See, that that was the one thing. That Vince, the people forget that it took him. He never got the Carolinas. He never got the Carolinas till Crockett folded up. He couldn't draw in the Carolinas right. at all. People didn't view that as wrestling. And then it would, took TBS killing the Carolinas wrestling. And then Vince came in, you know, in the late '90s in the Attitude Era. But that had been years. Right. Um, he never drew a house in Greensboro from 1984 to 1999. Um, Mid-South territory was incredibly difficult yeah. because people there were like, no, Mid-South wrestling is what wrestling is. Right. And Florida would have probably been the, and Memphis had its own thing, but uh, he, he did well in Louisville. It was just yeah. the city of Memphis, not the whole territory that right. kind of rejected it. But Florida would have been, with Eddie Graham still around, would that have been the toughest nut to crack? Yeah, I think it would have been because of how Eddie 
structured his whole business and his political connections. He could call somebody up and say, hey, I don't think they have a license for this, this, and this, you know. Yeah. We'll shut you down until you prove it to us. And well, he was in every major arena in the state at that point in right. time, almost every week, or right. the big events, you know, right. monthly or whatever, so he would have had relationships with every building manager. And I wonder, uh, this is something that I've thought about, I don't have the answer. Don't you think that he had the clause you know, a month before you couldn't run or a month after me. Yeah. Or, so, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? So or, I think, a, or a day with a Y yeah, in it yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, you can't, yeah, yeah. So, so the land issue, some people had said, well, Eddie flew the plane and right. he flew to the Bahamas a right. lot. But, that, you know, I think now we're getting into 9-11 was an inside job yeah, and yeah. et cetera. Uh, but how did you hear about I, what ha explain to the people what happened and how did you hear about it? Well, I was in uh, San Antonio, and it was Super Bowl Sunday. And Mike was at the game in, in uh, uh, Los Angeles. And this is crazy. There was a snowstorm in San Antonio. And the town was, I went down there for Luke Williams. Right? Yeah. Luke brought me in. Oh, the weekend. San Antonio of a yeah. Blanchard's office. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So Luke brought me in. Luke was always Snows good to there me. once yeah. every 20 years. Yeah, so yeah. we locked in, and uh, this guy I knew from Tampa called me and he said, Did you spin on the news? Did you hear the news? I said, What? He said, Eddie's dead. I said, What? You know, I couldn't believe it. And he said, Eddie's died. And they think it's a parent gunshot wound. Mike. They uh, sent a PA announcement at the Super Bowl. Mike Graham, please come to the office. Oh, that's right. He was at the yeah, Super Bowl. Yeah, right. yeah. He, he thought it was a rib, and he went there, and he got on the plane. So, I mean, it was, uh, uh, for him, Mike, it was like, he was blindsided by it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But in some recourse, when I look back, you know, sometimes you don't pay attention you, and you see things coming and you say, gee, I sh how did I miss that one? He got really, really out of sorts for Eddie. You know what I mean? He, his beard, he didn't shave for three or four days. You know what I mean? He wasn't using his boat. Uh, Eddie always had the blonde hair. It was streaked with gray and... He just wasn't himself, and I, I think that whatever it was, whether it was the 9-11 theory, which could be possible, or the land, or whatever, I think whatever he was bearing, he snapped. You know what I mean? Yeah. He just couldn't take it anymore. Your transformation to, and by the way, explain, you never worshipped the devil. No, and I never said. Explain this. Okay. Explain this for people. And th that that came right at, was it right before Eddie was gone or right afterward? What did he think about it? The oh. point is, if, if, if you okay. started it right at that point, explain what it was okay. and then tell what. When, when I started it, I, I uh, the angle was, I came back and I was a baby face. And Mike yep. had me come back with open arms. But Barry Windham and Blackjack said, this ain't the same guy that left here, you know what I mean? Yeah. Three years ago, this this guy's no good. We've known him all along, and I'm saying, hey, we all must make mistakes, blah, 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 blah. As I'm doing these interviews, and Mike's sticking up for me, and they want to hang me with the dress room split half yeah. and half, I started watching MTV, right? horror movies the genre was in, right? Billy Idol. So I said, I should be able to take something out of this. And I had just come back with Mark from Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong. I went to the cave temples in uh, Malaysia. And I, f f I talked to some of these people that are called Sifus, you know, the learned ones, and they tell me about this fertility god, Abu Dhin. I said, I never heard of that. And then we go to India and it's chewing the beetle nut and all this. So everything I said was uh, taken off a of Hindu's religion. Yeah. Right? And the beetle nut is what they partake in over there. And everything was going along fine until Apner put on, a, without no disclaimer from me, the devil is my manager. That's all they had to see in the Deep South, right? Yeah. All right yeah. So. 
I was hung, you know, at that time. <laughs> I was I was I was hung. And at that time, if you remember, you know, when uh MTV first came out too with all these videos, they were kind of dark and kind of that way, you yeah. know what I mean? So I just jumped on the bandwagon and went with it. But Eddie at first said to me, you better be careful with this. That's all I care, you know, I care. Just be careful with this. And uh, I knew he critiqued my interviews, you know what I mean? I never used that word, devil, I never said anything. And what happened was, <coughs> you know, Dusty got into that. The devil himself. The devil himself. The <laughs> yeah. devil made me do it. Yeah. Baby. And then he got into that, and then it became boom. You know. You know. Being Mark, and it didn't help me to say, "Oh, I'm not doing this." When Mark is rolling his eyes and <laughs> yeesh, yeesh, you know, <laughs> and, and, and he his leg, yeah, in the third <laughs> eye. And we're talking, and we're talking about feasting, rejoicing, and the other thing was because. We're going the other way. We're not wrestlers, right? We're this nuts of crazy best. We went everywhere with our robes on. I would go grocery shop with my robe on. I went in the gym one time. I went to the gym one time. Now, this wasn't a wrestling robe. You looked like one of the druids yeah. that yeah. accompanies the Undertaker yeah. out to, yeah. yeah. So Mark would wear his purple one. And I went into the gym one day. Uh, because there were some people talking about wrestling, you know. They say, me and Mark used to train together. And I say, I, Mark overheard them saying, uh, Mark can talk, see, uh, Hayes can talk. They're not wacky. Uh, Mark says, you got to do something tomorrow. He said, we'll go in separate. He said, I said, what do you want me to do? He said, ah, you come up with it. <laughs> so it was Rick Poston's gym, the one that Scott Hall always talks about, that he was trying to be a wrestler. Yeah, 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 yeah. I walk in there, Mark's in there, and I got my robe on, and I ha don't have shoes, and I say, who is following me for the summer? We're going to the burning sands. We're toughing our feet up. The people looked at me, and they went, whoa, let's go to the bathroom, you know what I mean? <laughs> so me and Mark would be driving down the road. This got to be such a kick, too. We'd be driving down the road, Mark would have the light on, we'd be drinking beer. If we'd be coming up that Yeehaw Junction three times a week, right? Yeah. First time it happens, <laughs> pulls us over. Marky jumps on. Thank you for protecting us. Good. I was speeding, wasn't I? Got cop was blown away, right? Marky says, thank you, officer. Thank you. Every week we come by, three times a week, the cop will stop us. What are you guys doing? I, eventually, Mark would say to him, hey, you want a beer? Well, I'm not supposed to. He said, who's going to know? You think I'm going to tell you? <laughs> yeah, man. we got a cop drinking the beer on the side of the road, and we're in a black robe and a purple robe. Well, that must have looked good to the people going by, huh? Well, you had you had all kinds of weirdos following you guys around, too. Oh, but what was the story the one time? The, with the, they, van, they, van. Yes, the van that burned the van. Here's the thing. Yeah, the, outside of Orlando, there's a town called Casadega. It's mediums, uh, people that believe in Whitaka, you know, the, the natural. Psychics, yeah, card you readers. Got, you got it. just the, got yeah, it. It's a the kind paranormal. Of, yeah, paranormal. Well, Orlando was good old boys. You know what I mean? They were cowboys. They came, Mulligan and uh, Dusty could talk them into the building. Mulligan used to say, Get mama from the kitchen. I need help. I went by the car. Smoke was billowing out of it. Pantyhose. I don't know what's going on in there. So these people from Casadega started coming to the matches and cheering me and Mark. Right? There was about five guys. And they come in a van and they gave me these elaborate set of bones, you know, that were varnished and stuff. So I said, I'm going to wear them tonight. So I wear them. These Bones kids. from what type of animal? It was a chicken. Okay. It was a chicken. Okay. And these kids jump up and they're, hey, get it, get it, you know. So it's me and Marky leaving. We see this huge fire. And we see the town folks chasing the Frankenstein monsters and beating them with boards and shit, <laughs> throwing rocks at them. And, Mark, and I said to Mark, should we stop? He said, are you shitting me? Let's keep going. Yeah. Let's get out of here. So they burned, burned their, their, their van down, beat right. the kids up. Yeah, beat the kids up. But they should have been carrying a snake. Cause you, yeah. how, where did you find all those people, those fucking snakes? You know, I had the, uh, it was crazy because, you know, 
Jake and I were partners first, and I carried the snake, right, yeah. before Jake. And uh, a friend of mine, his father was High Gardner. He was the, the only talk show Elvis was ever on, was on that show, High Gardner. High Gardner, yes. Yeah, around town with High. And uh, H.Y. Yeah. High Gardner, yeah. yeah. And Everything. his mother was Ask Marilyn in the syndicated newspapers, right? And the BBC just bought his father's old library, and they're going to do a special on him. Well, he's into snakes, so he was the first one to give me a snake. Then it's like anything else, monkey see, monkey do. At the uh, about two months later, I'd go to the buildings. There'd be twelve people there with all different kinds of snakes. You know what I mean? <laughs> I say, uh, yeah. Well, I get your choice. Well, a little bit about this one. It's an albino. <coughs> okay, yeah, we'll try that one tonight. I didn't steal the snake thing, but I did steal when you raised Mark Lew and Purple Haze yeah. from, you know, the, 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 the ocean, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, we didn't have an ocean in Louisville, but we had the Ohio River, and yeah. that's good enough, right? Yeah. So Leviathan, Batista, yeah. he comes in, and he's, he's so green, oh, my God. He, you know, off of the Samoan had taught him how to write a check. And <laughs> so we got him in class, and he was a frail demon, and he was real timid. He wanted to do what his wife told him to do, and he you know, kind of sat around. He put his hoodie on because he had a cold all the time. I said, here's what I'd like you to do, Dave. <laughs> you can take, you know, those, those contact lenses you wear, make your eyes look crazy, and the chain around your neck, and you got the bald head, and the tattoos you already had, and we call you Leviathan, the demon of the deep, the guardian of the gates of hell. I want you to walk, and it's about 10 o'clock at night. I want you to walk about 100 feet out there in the Ohio River. You're wearing your boots, okay? Even if you swim trunks boots, you're fine. Walk out about 100 feet in the Ohio River and get down to where only the top of your head is visible. <laughs> And we'll give you the Iggy and start walking this way until gradually you come out. It'll be perfect. He's, he's never seen the footage, right. right? So he's like, oh, my God. We get down there. There was some fishing fishermen there, and they had a campfire, and they were just leaving, walking down the bank. And we said, do you mind if we use y'all's campfire? And they're looking, and here is the disciples of sin, yeah. Slash and Damien. The one guy's got a knife gimmick, and we've got <laughs> uh, Judas dressed up with the duster coat and the preacher with the... The Bible yeah. is, dust comes out and sin is throwing the fireballs and there's Leviathan. I said, y'all aren't going to kill our dog, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. Your dog's fine. So we use the campfire and she's doing the spell of making yeah. all, all that yeah. stuff. And here he comes. He was shitting himself. He hated it out there. He was afraid he was going to get bit by a fish or get pneumonia or whatever. But we recreated that, and that was everybody to this day goes, how in the world did you come up with that? I said, simple. I just researched Kevin Sullivan's Florida wrestling tenure. Um, did you get any lawsuits out of that, by the way? Because there was some heavy stuff going on. No, I never got a lawsuit out of any of that. I mean, uh, after a while, I got so, you know, you, we, you've talked about this before, getting stabbed. Yeah. There were some times I was saying, boy, I'm looking, you know, this one's going to be tough to get out of, you know yeah. I mean? Especially in the Bahamas with Tyree Pride was brutal. I'll tell you a st quick story. Please tell me a story about Tyree uh, Pride okay, in the Bahamas. Ty Tyree Pride used to... J just so everybody knows, when you ran the Bahamas, it helped if you had a, a native... Bahamian, yeah, but he was on, he on the card, yeah. but he wasn't. But he played that part on television. No, right? he was a Saint Lucia from Saint Lucia. Ah. But a lot of them came to the Bahamas, so there was a whole group of people from Saint Lucia that would come to the Bahamas. What, how how big was he? What was he? Five, six, you know, one hundred and seventy, sixty, something seven. like that. And he's beating everybody, including Ric Flair, yeah. because nobody wants to beat the guy. Because it'll be another one of those Jack Venino situations with Flair. <laughs> Exactly. They're going to kill me here. You win. Anyway, go ahead. Exactly. So uh, the thing was, I, that was a brutal place. The only time I've ever seen Haku stagger, we used to dress in a room like this and then run to the ring, the heels, right? As Haku was coming back, they had a cinder block, and from the roof, they threw it, hit him in the head. It cracked, and he stumbled, but he got in. Yeah. One night, Blackjack was, I mean, uh, Jake was wrestling uh, Tyree, and the heels had left. And they busted the doors down, and Jake tried to hide under a wrestling mat. And they had <laughs> sticks, and they were beating him like you would a rat that had gone underneath the thing. So you can see how dangerous it is, okay? So now it's gotten worse because they're throwing shit now all the time. So yeah. they build 
a tunnel for us, but they build it with chain link fence. So the umbrellas are coming oh, yeah, through. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the umbrellas Stay are coming through. So, so they, uh, they got us a cattle chute in Tulsa where it was a solid wood yeah. and about six feet tall and you know you just uh, you know moo we yeah. used to moo on the way to the ring but they couldn't get us they'd have to reach over and it was harder that way couldn't get leverage oh so i was trying not to get killed because i had gone to the bahamas i actually lived there for a while so i knew a lot of people over there and they have a thing over there the bahamians where it's my color then really black in the same family in the you know what I mean they're mixed blood but my color I'd have black in me and I'd call myself they call them conky joes right so I used to say how can my people cheer this guy that's an illegal alien and I'm a conky joe I'm doing everything to save my ass right I'm a conky joe brother you know everything good man I didn't do my gimmick over there right yeah so one night the promoter comes to me and says, we're in a cage match. Uh, you know, they all say it's sold to the rafters. Well, this one, they were sitting on broken glass bottles that they had put in the cement up there. You saw it, Jimmy, the broken black Oh, bottles, yes, yes. And they would sit on them, okay? Ooh, so the, Which had to be uncomfortable. No heel ever went over there, right? No heel ever won a match. So the promoter comes to me and says... And that, that, that was one of those towns where if they wanted you to win, you would argue with yeah, them. No, yeah, no, yeah, we're yeah. not, we, you know, no. We'll put them over, flat, boom, yeah. done. Let's yeah. just get out of here. No heat. Yeah. You know, try no not heat. to get heat. So they said to me, you're in a cage match with Tyree. What if Mark comes down, the referee gets knocked down, and you guys hang him? I said, <laughs> let me understand what you just said again. You want me to double team a black man and hang him in front of 99.9% .9 St. Lucians out there? They said, yeah. I said, who's going to protect me? And the, the, the owner, the promoter, his name was Charlie Majors, and he was a con in the Congress there. He, and he had a son that was a midget about this high. He said... I'll protect you. I said, what? He said, I'll protect you and I'll have the police around me. I said, Charlie, if I do this and I walk out of that, open that door, and you're not there, I'll kill you. Because <laughs> they offered me a bribe to do it. And I said, okay. <laughs> Mark comes down. We hang him. I open the door and as I straddled the ring in the railing, there's Charlie. But now there's a wave, right? Yeah. Charlie's got a chair, right? I grabbed Charlie and put him on my head. <laughs> he got to the dress room. He was split from here, here. They beat him to death. <laughs> the chair was boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Wait, it gets better. He's bleeding. He's going to get stitches. There's the uh, uh, ambulance guy there looking at him. And his son, the midget, comes the midget. in and sees his dad and goes, oh, and fell. I ran over, right over and put the boots to him. <laughs> I said, God damn it, you deserve it too. You were supposed to be out there. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. could have saved me. He, yeah, it was, I mean, but he drew so much money down there. And he yeah. also drew in Miami because there's so many yeah. people from the Caribbean in Miami, yeah. you know, yeah. You, you had so many angles where you, you pushed things. And actually, we had somebody write in earlier, fan mail from some flounder, uh, to say they put a stamp on it, put it in the mailbox, whole nine yards. The angle where you threw the ink in Dusty's sister's eyes on the This Is Your Life, yeah. Dusty Rhodes segment. Explain it and then tell what kind of feedback you got from it. Oh, what happened was I had lost a Lose a Leaf Town match. Mark and I were recruited by Jimmy Crockett to go for the first arcade. They actually flew us up to the airport, met with us, said, and Mark and I were making good money. They said, we'll triple your money, blah, blah, blah. So I tell Dusty, so Dusty was the midnight rider then, and uh, I lose a lose a leaf time match, but I come back in the mask, and it's me against Dusty in a cage. You know, loser is going to be unmasked. So I get loose and I'm gone. I go up to Charlotte. So I'm up to Charlotte. 
we're not getting anything because they shut the territory down just about because they get ready for Starcade. They ready for Starcade. They, they didn't just, want to burn everything out. Yeah, yeah, they're doing all this TVs and not making any money. And after I got my Starcade payoff, I said, I'm out of here. But the week I didn't get any kind of money at all to even live on, Dusty called me and said, I'd like you to come back. And I said, okay. So I wasn't in the territory where they did this. Dusty, uh, this is your life, like the old TV program. So people come out and mention Dusty and Dusty say, oh, that's Billy Bob Walker or whatever. <laughs> come over. So then they do this thing where it's a sister, supposedly, and she says, oh, thank you for being such a great uh, older brother, protect me all the time. So she comes out. Now all the baby faces come out and hugging Dusty and, you know, kissing his ass. And I come in like Jack Ruby with because he was signing uh, a con uh, track for Ric Flair. And with a big quill pen, right? And the, the ceremonial pen yeah, and the yeah, inkwell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I grab the ink and I throw it. Dusty, he ducks and blinds his sister. So <laughs> Now he's he's saying, I want Kevin Sullivan back in the NWA saying, I'm suspended for five years or indefinitely or whatever. So they have an emergency meeting. And again, how he tied things in. Yeah. Two of them vote to keep me suspended. Two of them vote to allow me to wrestle. The deciding vote is Eddie. Dusty does... One of the best promos I ever saw him do, you know, you gotta do it for me. You gotta, you gotta do And they said, okay. So that was the thing. And then Dusty and I went to Lakeland and the dream did the right thing for business. My first night back, he put me over. And a lot of heat, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I mean, I beat him with a cuss an object, but the people thought, well, you know, first of all, I'm gone. Okay, I came back, I'm going to be gone again. But yeah. when I beat him, it was like a, a you know, jump starting the heart again. It got beaten again. And, yeah. you know, yeah, I, I mean, I got a lot. I was afraid some nights, you know, I'd be looking at guys and I'd say, what's in their hands, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, and you're wearing trunks. I used to have them wearing a suit with a thick jacket and sometime in Louisiana, especially a bulletproof yeah. vest underneath. Not I, was, I wasn't afraid they would shoot me, but it stops right, knives, nice. too. You're out there in your swimming trunks. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it, did you get the fire from the Sheik? Throwing yeah, fire? absolutely. You got, of course you did. You know, I stole everything from yeah, him. If you you re researched it. Yeah. You researched it. You know, the, the, the fireball thing, that's when, when Dusty had me do it with Roddy right. Garvin. I never knew. I didn't know what it was, right? Right. And so then I, I found out, but I, I knew you got it there. And remember when you worked for me in Smoky Mountain, yeah. they had banned... The flash paper. It's right. a magician's trick. It's it's a paper that is chemically treated, and when you touch it with anything that is hot enough to to tick it off, that it boom, it bursts into lighter than air flame and go boom. But unless it sticks on your face, yeah. it's not really good. Although I burned Ronnie's eyebrows yeah. off and his fucking nose hair and everything, he said <laughs> make it look good. But I had to get your paper when you'd come up to me in, yeah. in Knoxville because they made it illegal in Florida because the bookies were writing the bets on the yeah. paper and when the cops would come in, they just touch it, boom, it's gone and there's no... Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. You know, you should you should have tried to figure out a way to have more gimmicks. You never really had you did the fire and the snakes yeah. and, yeah. The <laughs> and the... And the spike, you know. So when Eddie had, had died, this was January of 85, yeah. right? Yeah. January of 85. The territory was doing reasonably well, but what did, did you talk to anybody down there at the time? What did the guys think? What was, you know, in, in everybody's mind? Is this the end? What's well, going to go on? Well, Who's going to carry the, the flag? I think they thought that Dusty was going to come back. And he was already working for Crockett. Yeah, they thought he was coming back. In fact, he kind of gave indications that he was coming back to Mike. So they thought Dusty was going to come back. Everything was going to be okay. I was outside the territory. Mike was trying to run it by himself, and he had Hero and Duke on his shoulder every day. And about, so that was January. I think in like May, Hero called me and said, we need you to come back. Yeah. So I came back, but 
When I came back, I knew without Eddie at the helm and making deals and talking, to, you know, I, I, it was really easy for me to see because I pick up a Tampa Tribune one day and it's Tuesday and there's not an ad in the paper. And there's not a yeah. any kind of byline or anything. And I said, ah, you know, without him, it's going to be tough. And it was, you know. Yeah. And then they made the deal with Crockett to sell out to Crockett. Yeah, that was the, what, yeah. less less than two years yeah. later. Maybe. Then he sent, you know, I'm not knocking anybody, but they were green kids, right? And yeah. uh, they been had seen who you said had been there. And that's take. that's the midnight I first went down to Florida at that point. We had made maybe a shot or two when they did some co-promotions, but I never got to work for Eddie Graham, never yeah. got to meet Eddie Graham. Really? He was at Jerry Jarrett's housewarming. Six weeks before I became a manager, I'm just there taking pictures, and I see Eddie Graham and Bill Watts was there. I'm like, you know, yeah. who the fuck am I? It's not like today yeah. where I, the schlub that sets up the ring, when the owner of the company comes in, the ring guy has to come up and make sure to shake your hand. Hello. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hell, where'd this handshake thing come from? That w When you first got into business, would you have gone over and interrupted Eddie Graham and Hero Matsuda? No. Would I have gone up in the corner at Jimmy Crockett and Dusty Rhodes are huddled up like this, and I'm going to come from the back and come over to shake their hand and say, yeah, I'm interrupting your conversation, but just want you to know I'm in the building. Where the fuck did this shit come from? I have no idea. But anyway, I digress. The point is, um, so it was a couple of years after that, and uh, Crockett bought it. He tried to keep, uh, for a while, it's separate because he was trying to collect the uh, the television uh, stations and right. television coverage that the central states had and Florida had and UWF had, et cetera, so he could put the syndicated package together, but it didn't work. But that, that, that where I was going, that's the first time we got to work with Mike Graham. Yeah. And I got to be honest, you know, I had seen him, I'd saw him at the, the right. show in Memphis right. and a couple of times I'd seen him on TV, but I thought, well, you know, he's the boss's son and he's right. never really been anywhere else. Right. Right. He didn't have to be. But when, the first thing he said was it was him and Rex King, little right. Rex King, yeah. nobody believed could whip cream with an outboard motor. <laughs> and first thing he said was, I'm going to do the job because if you beat him, it won't mean anything. Second thing, get the heat on me and give him a false tag, let him have a little comeback. And then blah, blah, blah. He did the whole thing and set the whole thing up. His work was tremendous, but it looked like he had, he pretty much had the whole match because yeah. Rex was just underneath right. guy at that point. And he, either we got the heat on him or he was shining or whatever. And then at the end, he's making it. Then he starts his own comeback. And the finish, as I jump up on the apron to scream at the referee, uh, he's going to roll one of my guys up. My guy drops flat and he runs. And I throw up my racket at the last second and he right. runs headfirst into the loaded racket, knocks himself out, and the Midnight Express beat him. So he, he, he did most of the shine. Right. We got the heat on him. False tag, he made his own comeback and beat himself, and we got over, and he's a tremendous worker, and everybody looked like a million dollars. Yeah. And I said, okay, now I see where he got it from, you know, and, and what the whole thing about Mike was. So that was, that was an eye-opener. Well, I'll tell you how a good guy he was, was when we were tag team champions, I, or when we were uh, tagging, I dropped the fall for yep. two years, okay? When I went off on my own and uh, went to Atlanta, TV champion, and Knoxville and different places, Mike would make sure that they booked them against me, and he'd do the job for me. I mean, I did it in about five or six territories with him. So he was trying to pay me back for my hard work for him. And, you know, not many guys do that, you know what I mean? Especially yeah. like you said, the boss's son, and yeah. he didn't have to do this. He didn't even have to work. I bet George that. Goulas never did that. No, <laughs> the, the jet set. <laughs> he had Bobby Eaton to lose all the falls yeah. and, and do all the work. All right, in Florida, or then maybe outside of Florida, who's your favorite opponent? Who's the best guy you ever worked with to make money or to have fun? And who's the best wrestler you've seen? Best wrestler? Yeah, in Ray, your opinion. Ray Stevens, okay. Johnny Valentine. Real thin line. Yeah, I mean, uh, Mark Lewin's up there, babyface or heel, you know. And I'm gonna throw some names out for people that never get the nod. Brad Armstrong was, Jim yeah, uh -huh. yeah. God, there was he was great. Uh, Ray Stevens was another really good guy. I was in San Francisco and I got a little break there, and they brought him in to be my partner, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you get to team with Ray Stevens yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, I, I came up to him and I said, uh, Ray, uh, 
uh, they won a DQ, and because of the, we were against the Von uh, Braunos and they were the champs, I said they won a DQ. What if I sell for you, give you a tag, and what do you think we could use for finish? He said, no, you got it all wrong on that. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> he said, I'm selling for you. This is your town now. You make the comeback, we'll end up going to the floor with both of them and we'll have a count out. He said, but you make the comeback. And he went out and sold, and I'm in the ring. And Rick, I'm sorry, but uh, that ain't the upside down bump. Yeah, you yeah. Know what I mean? <laughs> that is not the upside down bump. And I mean, I was watching him, and it was like watching a, a river. You and know this I mean? at the time he'd been he'd been wrestling for 25 years, oh, right? 30 or 30 yeah, at that point. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, another guy. You know, you know what? And I understand when everybody does it now, they grab the middle rope. And, of course, Rick goes a little sideways because yeah, yeah. of his back, and I can understand that. But everybody grabs it, and Michael's made it look so pretty. It doesn't hurt, and yeah. it's all flippy-floppy and everything. But Stevens, you couldn't even tell when he turned. They just, like the old-fashioned arm right, whip, right. where they would grab the, the wrist with both hands and just yank like that, and one little yank, and somehow he made it visually plausible that just that one little yank, as he was already running full speed across, he would fly upside down, wouldn't grab anything. The shoulders would hit the middle, the ass would hit the top. Yeah. He'd go up over, come back, down, boom, just instantly. And you'd, yeah. the hell, how did that happen? It, yeah. was, it was amazing. I mean, I, I've been lucky, and you have too, Jimmy. We've seen some, you had, I mean, Bobby, okay? Yeah, yeah. But we've seen some great performers in our day, and they're all different, you know what I mean? Even though the chic was violence, you have to be a great performer to stay that yeah. long. But and in his younger days, he was a hell of an athlete and, and showed yeah. that. It's just as he got older, that's what, what worked for it. But the other one is Valentine. You know, it took him a while to get over yeah. because he was so believable. He beat you to death. But I, I was in St. Louis with him one time. And, uh, you know, going to St. Louis was a big deal, right, for anybody. And he, I always got along good with him. And he's... Uh, I actually went 15 minutes with him on TV when it was Beat the Champ, the Silver Dollars. Yeah. Came over to me and said, uh, you think you can carry me for 15 minutes? I went, what? He said, yeah, we're going to go through 15 minutes. And he was going for the elbow, and I was he just like, move, move, you know. And he was whacking me, and I'd fight back. But I would talk to him about psychology sometimes, and I said, he, I said Johnny, how do you... How do you do it? You know, yeah. go on. I'm stupid. Let <laughs> me in on it. He said, I'll show you tonight. He goes out and he had that black robe and he looked terrific. You know, Johnny looked like a wrestler, didn't yeah. he? You know what I mean? Yeah. And he takes off the robe. And the he's, atomic he's, blonde. Yeah. As he's taken off the robe, he looks, stops taking off the robe, and he's looking up at the top balcony in St. Louis. So I'm saying, what the hell is he looking at? And I see about, just like right here, the four guys start screaming. What the fuck's he looking at, right? Yeah. Before he took off the robe, he had them ready to jump off the balcony. And it was just that eye contact. He looked so vicious, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of scared you like a bad dog, you know what I mean? He looked like a bad dog. I mean, he was amazing. And also part of that art is making the people notice what you're looking at without... <laughs> letting them know that you're wanting them to notice what you're looking at. So you look and you see yeah. a little double take and, you, and then you can't resist. You have yeah. to look more and then all of a sudden you start getting hot about it. And now you're letting now people are, oh, what's he looking like you were? Yeah. And by the time you get, it could be nobody up there, but right. you, 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 like that, now they're fucking hot. You're looking at nothing. Yeah. Yeah. But you you can't let them know that you're and, wanting them to eavesdrop on you. They have to be catching you something, doing something that, yeah, and, you know what I'm saying. And this is what I think's wrong with the business. They uh, got never got the rub with the guys that they should have. You know, we, I mean? we lost a generation. Yeah, we lost a generation yeah. in all that bullshit in the yeah. '90s. Yeah, and. The guys that knew how to do it were making a lot of money and didn't really particularly give a shit, yeah. some of them, about yeah. bringing the other guys up. Didn't want to lose a spot. And a lot of the guys just went home. Yeah. The, the promoters that knew how to do all this stuff. They said, okay, yeah. well, we got our money or we lost our money, but one way or another, we're at home. We'll see you later. And, you know, we lost a generation. Now yeah. they all started trying to figure it out for themselves, but they're like going back trying to find that missing link. Where yeah. did we go? Yeah. But anyway, regardless, we have taken a trip 
to Championship Wrestling from Florida. And before we close out this marathon <laughs> edition of everything you wanted to know about everything we've ever <laughs> talked about, what's your favorite Florida memory and, and what do you think, what's your favorite Florida memory and what would have happened if Eddie Graham had lived? How long would Florida wrestling have, have gone on before I the eventual happened? I think he might have been able to work out something with Vince, you know what I mean? I think he might have said, hey, listen, you're going to need a place to send guys. Yeah. Send me a few guys, like, you know, Smoky Mountain or yeah. OBW. Yeah, like, I think he might have been. And here. how old was he? He was 50 something at the time, uh, mid, late 50s. He, he was, wasn't that old. He was 54 or 5. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah. was in 1985. Yeah. He would have been. He was Pat Patterson's age. Yeah. He would have been 70 during the Attitude Era. Right. Can you imagine Eddie Graham giving finishes to Stone Cold Steve Austin and That'd The Rock? That would be incredible. Uh, be incredible. I think I just got a stiffy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Kevin, thank, thank you, you very much. So long from the Sunshine State. State of Florida. <laughs>